Thank you. Uh, the first item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Is there a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Ms. Downey, is there a second? Ms. Stowe. All right, so we're going to take a, a roll call vote. Uh, Bernstein is a yes. Stowe? Yes. Hirsch? Yes. Downey? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Kowalski? Yes. Megan? Yes. Thank you. Hey, that worked. Fantastic. Uh, and Mr. Scher is not in the room and I don't see him online. So that passes 7-0. Thank you. All right. So we're going to move on to one of my favorite things, the student and staff recognitions. Uh, the first item up is the United States Presidential Scholar. So Ms. Nadell, take it away. Thank you, Superintendent, District Leaders, and members of the Board of Education. We are pleased to have the opportunity this evening to honor Greenwich High School senior and soon to be graduate of the class of 2021, Mr. Colin Speaker. Colin Speaker is one of only 161 seniors across the country to earn the United States, United States Presidential Scholars Award. Quoting Miguel Cardona, our U.S. Secretary of Education, the 2021 Presidential Scholars represent extraordinary achievement in our ex extraordinary times. The program is intended to remind us all of the great potential in each new generation and to renew our commitment to helping them achieve their dreams. Quoting Kelly Dwyer, Collins School Counselor, Collins Speaker has a rare combination of great intellect, great passion, great determination, and the ability to lead and effectively communicate with his peers. He has been extensively involved in volunteer service in the community. He's not afraid of trying new things or failing in the pursuit of a goal. Colin contributes 100% to every organization in which he participates. He is a person who cares more about the success of the entity as a whole rather than his own individual success. Finally, quoting Colin himself, from Parkway School to Western Middle School to Greenwich High, the Greenwich Public School System has provided me with an exceptional education, both in and out of the classroom. Colin is continuing his studies at the University of Pennsylvania in the fall, where he will no doubt be a powerful positive influence in the Jerome Fisher Program in Management and Technology. Colin, you have our very best wishes for continued success, health, and happiness. All right, next up is the Winter All-State Student Athletes. So Mr. Mayo, Mr. Ledeen. Good evening, uh, Chairman Bernstein. Superintendent Jones, members of the Board of Education. It's my pleasure tonight to uh, announce the 12 uh, All-State athletes that we had uh, this year in, the, in our winter season. But before I announce their names, I'd also like to congratulate Colin and his family for this remarkable, really remarkable achievement as being named President or Scholar. Colin also, uh, vital member of student governments this year and the co-captain of the tennis team. So. I don't know how he has time to do anything else, but uh, thanks, Colin, for an honor to all of us. Um, our, back to all state, our, our, our athletic director um, couldn't be with us tonight, Mr. Lindeen, because he's at the lacrosse game. It was senior night and he thought he, he, he needed to be there uh, and uh, be with the team uh, on senior night. So, uh, and Gus uh, Lindeen is an amazing athletic director and I wanted to introduce him tonight so he could as the athletes, but uh, uh, like I said, he is committed to uh, our teams and their their games right now. Um, so, uh, here I go. Uh, All state cheerleading: uh, Avery Banks, Carissa Generelli, and Alexander Corral. All state cheerleading. All state boys hockey team: Charlie Zolin. Charlie Zolin, All-State Boys Hockey. All-State Boys Swimming and Diving. Uh, Ryan G. Aiden Bukaria. 
James Pascal, Nicholas Malchow, Whitaker Grover, and Alex Plavukas. And finally, our All-State ski team, Sophia Bastic and Matthew Siska. Congratulations to our All-State uh, honorees. Thank you, Mr. Bernstein. Bizarre all state musician. Good evening. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, each year, more than, well, several thousand vocalists and instrumentalists from every public and private high school in Connecticut audition for the four all-state performing groups. Those are band, chorus, orchestra, and jazz band. This is a two-stage process with a first round of auditions in November and a second round in February. Due, the, due to the pandemic, this year's auditions took place via video submissions that necessitated additional planning and preparation by the students. Nonetheless, I am pleased to report that Greenwich High School once again had more musicians selected for all-state than did any other high school in the state. The students honored here this evening have spent many years working hard to become fine musicians. And although it is primarily their passion and talent for music that has led them to this impressive achievement, their efforts have been consistently supported by their parents and families, by our exceptionally strong K-12 music faculty, our school administrations, and our board of education, all of which place a high priority on arts education. Although the students aren't able to participate in an in-person Allstate Music Festival this year, the Connecticut Music Educators Association uh, created a variety of virtual activities to educate and inspire these students to even higher levels of excellence. I am pleased to present to you the 37 Greenwich High School musicians who have been selected to represent our school in this year's all-state band, chorus, or orchestra. We had nine members of our band program selected for all-state. Those students are Alexandra Bailey, Andrew Bailey, Brady Bailey, Brady. Amane Chibana, C.C. J, Skylar McDonald, Iris Shi, Shun Ueda, and Harrison Wolf. We had 22 students from the chorus selected for the All-State Chorus. Those students are Charles Adorni, Lucy Bay, Gregory Bound, Michaela Browning, Grace Collier, Nathaniel Ellis, Darian Fauser, Michelle Ferrone, Daryl Furno, Jackson Gales, Ronit Gupta, Brooke Haddon, Neha Iyer, Alexis Colleen, Lara Kushuris, Bryn Kummel, Gabriella Mendoza, Esther Shah, Isaiah Sohn, Yuta Takahashi, Jacob Winston, and Ziggy Yan. And finally, seven members of our orchestra were selected. Lucy Bay, Melissa Byram, Alyssa Feng, Benjamin Grunbaum, Eureka Sakai, Anna Weeksner, and Heather Zitzman. Congratulations to one and all. Mr. Jones. Uh, thank you to the board. Um, after winning its 12th consecutive Fairfield County title in, in early April, the Math Cardinals took on the best teams in the state. GHS held off Amity and New Canaan to win its 11th state title in the last 12 years, led by uh, senior Sam Florence perfect score. Senior captains Iris Shee and Sam Florin did a remarkable job guiding the team through this difficult year, my many thanks to them. 
My thanks also to the Board of Ed for recognizing the team over the last 13 years. I have confidence that Tanner Caracas will do a great job leading, leading the team from here on out. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the state championship math team, Sam Florin, Iris Shi, Stephen Blank, Stephanie Chang, Jason Zong, Brandon Yu, Ira Drews, and Alan Shu. Thank you. devoting time to student voices at each meeting, and I'm excited to participate in one of the first in-person meetings. As we near the end of AP exams, I have some updates to share about what is going on in the GHS community. First of all, it has been really exciting to have seniors and now also juniors make a full return to school. We're all seeing peers that we haven't seen in person since last March, and with this, the sense of community is much stronger than it was before. The freshman and sophomore classes are now also eagerly awaiting the days in June when they can also return. Additionally, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors alike are all looking forward to their respective fun days in which activities and food trucks will be set up around the school. It has been a tough year and students have definitely been missing these special types of activities and class bonding that contribute to the community feel of GHS. In other news, the senior and junior classes have put together prom committees and the senior class is currently in the process of finalizing a graduation speaker. Student government also led a very successful initiative during Teacher Appreciation Week where students could send messages of gratitude to their teachers. We emailed well over 300 individual personalized gratitude grams to well-deserving teachers. I will now wrap this up by stating that the spring is beginning to feel more and more normal and we can't wait until the fall when hopefully everyone will be back in person. Thank you all for supporting our school community. And I will now turn the mic over to our student body president, Mark Chen. Good evening, Chairman Bernstein, Dr. Jones, members of the board, cabinet, and meeting attendees. My name is Mark Chen, student body president at Greenwich High School. It is really so wonderful to be here in person with you all tonight. I'd like to take a moment to recognize Colin Speaker for being named a presidential scholar. Uh, he's an integral member of student government's executive committee as VP of student concerns and has been a pheno phenomenal year with him as part of our team. And as far as student government goes, we are wrapping up our year uh, in less than two weeks time. We'll have our transition meetings with the new executive committee and perhaps the new student body president and senior class president will make their debut at the next board of education meeting. I'd also like to take this opportunity to express my support for the Board of Education as they navigate the challenges of the Cardinal Stadium project. Our community and GHS students especially are truly excited for the future of the stadium, and I hope that we could find an expeditious resolution to the current tree removal process. This is a project that has been long in the making and long overdue, and we are all looking forward to its continued progress and eventual completion. I'm so happy to end the year on a, such a high note as we begin to reach some sense of normalcy. It has been incredibly special to have all the seniors back full time and now juniors, and many of us have not seen each other in over a year. The energy is completely different and my classes are full of wondrous conversation and life. It is also my understanding that GHS hasn't had any new positive cases in a week now, which is such great news. I'm sure that there are many here uh, who are also fami familiar with, or I've seen pictures of the rows of ind individual desks set up in the student center for lunch. And I'm happy to say that there is now the return of the original lunch tables with plexiglass set up in the middle of each. We've also moved breakfast back to the student center from the gym. 
Sir Rush assured that there have been many quality of life improvements for students. And as I look to a normal prom, graduation, and senior internship experience in the coming month, I remain incredibly grateful for all the work that everyone here has done for us to be able to even reach this point. I recognize that even staying open all year is no small feat. I look forward to speaking with you all again very soon. Thank you for your time tonight. It is always a pleasure. Thank you very much, Hadley and Mark. Aaron, are you sure this is on? Are you, sure, are you sure this is on? Uh, can those of you at home hear me, Megan, if you could give me the high sign? Yep, I hear you. I hear them okay, speaking. Thank you. All right, next up is the uh, GEA comments. So Carol Sutton. Good evening, board members, Dr. Jones. Oh, hang on one second, Carol. Oh. Get the microphone set up for you. Okay. All right, Carol, you should be good. Okay. Good evening, board members, Dr. Jones, cabinet, and members of the Greenwich Public School community on Zoom. My name, My name is Carol Sutton, 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 and I'm honored, I'm honored to present to 900, 900 members of Greenwich, of Greenwich Education Association. Congratulations to this evening's student honorees. May your performance in the classroom, the arts and athletics continue to bring you not only accolades, but joy in the years to come. Congratulations on the RTM budget vote and thank you to the board, Dr. Jones, Mr. O'Keefe and the rest of the team that worked to make it happen. With only five weeks left in the school year, GEA has its mind on the future. It is exciting to see the plan for the secure entryway for GHS coming to fruition in the very near future. It has been 22 years since Columbine and nine years since Sandy Hook. Finally, GHS is getting the secure entry that it needs and deserves. We also appreciate that the district is, uh, is, has created a clear procedure to deal with matters of ADA noncompliance. We appreciate that work is ongoing to address deficiencies in this area and implore the BOE to use whatever means necessary to bring needed change to Julian Curtis, OG, Riverside Western, and also Havenmeyer. With about $10 million in ESSER three funds coming to Greenwich Public Schools, teachers are looking forward to meaningful participation in decisions about how the money is allocated. All signs point to a need for more mental health support for students who have dealt with trauma during COVID and a need for resources to support the unique needs of learners who have not thrived during pandemic education. One sure thing is that if there is, are remote options for Greenwich students in the fall, teachers do not want the next normal to rely on live streaming. While dual teaching of remote and in-person students simultaneously may be economical and a good plan on paper, the consensus is that it is inadequate and unsustainable for everyone involved. If the board would like to hear more, GEA will be glad to set up a listening session with our members. Finally, this time of year is one of transitions, not just the changing seasons, but students changing grade levels, graduating from pre-K, fifth grade, eighth grade, and high school with the requisite celebrations. <clears throat> the end of school year marks a transition for me too, as I retire after 39 years as an educator, eight of them as GEA president. During nearly 40 years in the field, I have remained optimistic about the Greenwich Public Schools because our community has norms and processes that help us engage to solve problems together. Today, these norms are being attacked by an individual or group that has littered school property and retail parking lots with specious accusations and solicitations of anonymous complaints against our schools. This has created consternation and dismay at the end of the most difficult year we have ever had as a school community. These actions are the antithesis of how we work together to solve problems and address differences of opinion. They are not productive and they are a terrible example for our students. Thank you and we look forward to a productive meeting. All right, thank you. All right, our next uh, speaker represents PT Council, Brian Peldunas. Good evening. I am Brian Peldunas, President of PTA Council, representing the 15 school PTAs and the families of all of their members. PTA Council congratulates all of the honorees this evening. The breadth of the areas covered by these honorees demonstrates the historic quality of our school district. 
PTA Council would like to thank all of the recently elected incoming PTA presidents, committee chairs, and board of director members for the coming 21-22 year or term for volunteering and all of the continuing and outgoing council members for their service. PTA Council will host a virtual recognition ceremony on June 10th to thank all of our volunteers and partners. <clears throat> PTA Council and our member PTAs look forward to being involved this summer in the community and staff discussions about the education-related COVID relief funds being provided to the district. We are available to provide any as appropriate assistance. One of PTA Council's goals this year has been to be consistent in our comments and vigorous in our follow-up. We continue to recognize the difficult environment in which we operate. However, we ask the Board of Education to not lose sight of the various initiatives and information promised as a result of the discussions held at these meetings, of which we have reminded you regularly. First, Chromebook issues, particularly at the high school level. We understand Chromebook purchased for incoming sixth and ninth graders this fall will have appropriate capacity for remote learning at the same cost as the older models. And we hope that the legacy books are not a hindrance in a quote, normal unquote world of learning for those with Chromebooks issued prior to the 21-22 school year. Second, we continue to emphasize the desirability of placing additional updated or corrected information requested by the Board of Education on the district website in the, website, in, in the, in the locations website, easily accessible to all. Accessible to all. Third, we reiterate, Third, we reiterate, reiterate I'm getting a lot of feedback, Peter. Okay. Third, we reiterate PTA Council's desire to participate in the needed follow-up on work as described in the ALP report. Our Academic Excellence Committee will speak later to amplify the approach that committee is taking to work together with the district and with teachers on curriculum. On tonight's agenda, we note the lack of documentation for six of the 10 discussion or action items. Perhaps it would be helpful to label items which only have verbal updates so that the public can prepare appropriately to provide comments on the, at the next public hearing. We look forward to the update from the Strategic Planning Committee and note that time is slipping away to accomplish a survey this school year or to make progress prior to the election of new BOE members this fall. As we get close to the end of the school year, the PTA Council Board of Directors would like to express our appreciation to Dr. Jones for her openness and responsiveness to questions and concerns raised by and through PTA Council during our monthly meetings, emphasizing the plural with her. Finally, we understand that bids were only open yesterday, but we continue to ask all involved to expedite processes in order to get all North Miami students back into their school as soon as possible. Thank you, and I will see you next uh, month in person, I hope. Take care. Speaker gets three minutes to speak. Okay. All right. All right. Try now. Okay. So each speaker is going to get three minutes to speak. Uh, we would ask that you be respectful. Uh, nothing inappropriate. Uh, if we, if we have to give you a warning once and uh, and that doesn't take, then we will actually cut you off. We'd rather not do that. Uh, you may offer objective criticism of district operations and programs, uh, but uh, not towards individual personnel. Uh, we ask you we ask you to act with civility per our policy, uh, with due respect for the dignity and privacy of others affected by your comments. Uh, you should be aware that uh, if your statements violate the rights of others under the law of defamation or invasion of privacy, that you could be held legal, legally responsible. Uh, if you're unsure of what those ramifications are, you should probably consult with somebody, not us. Um, so again, please be civil. That's all we ask. Uh, and with that, we're going to start our public comments. Uh, you'll get a warning at 30 seconds. So the first speaker is Jackie Homan. Jackie. Jackie. Oh, she's, oh, she's here. Oh, oh okay. okay. Even better. Even better. Uh, 
I've been asking all year for the board to take action on a variety of issues, yet nothing ever happens as a result of my complaints. I'm lucky if I get an auto-generated response, a clear violation of the board's own code of ethics. The first issue this year involved my mask-exempt middle schooler who learned the social studies grading policy included mask usage and social distancing. The policy felt discriminatory, singling out literally the only child in the building with a medical condition that prevented him from safely wearing a mask. A week later, again in social studies, he learned the news sources he used to complete his homework were considered fake news by his teacher, who shared a chart that depicted most conservative sites as propaganda. And it wasn't just his teacher who considered the sites to be fake news. Most were blocked by the technology department, so my son couldn't access conservative news sites from his computer. Again, it felt discriminatory. As the year progressed, my son would get bullied for exercising his right to be mask-free at school. But it wasn't the children who were the bullies. It was teachers who bullied him, and without repercussion, I might add, despite the fact their actions directly cause a flare-up of his medical condition. I've complained about the teaching style in math where students don't face the teacher inside the room. Rather, the teacher faces the students' backs while she conducts class over Zoom, carefully monitoring the students' activities as if they're taking part in an Orwellian experiment. I raised an issue with the principal after an English teacher played a video from a series called Feminist Fridays that discussed racial inequity in Hollywood. How's that considered English? It sounds like a social justice training camp. When my child pointed out the creator of Feminist Fridays, or when a child pointed out the creator of Feminist Friday seemed to be making the topic more divisive by talking about equity instead of talking about the things that bring, bring people together, the teacher said the child was wrong. When I asked the superintendent PTA and board to correct lies told by a local doctor on a PTA call, nothing happened. I asked for the word unapproved to be used when talking about the experimental gene therapy products, just like it says in the package inserts themselves, yet I received no response. When my son received racially charged, sexually explicit, and profanity-laced homework, I complained again. Guess what? I was told the content was thought-provoking. I thought if the content is so thought-provoking, why not share it with my community so that they can see what they think? And you know what happened? The people in my community thought it was so vulgar, the police were called on me two times. The officer said, can't you just tell the super or the board? Then I explained the troubling pattern, the hypocrisy of censuring a conservative board member while allowing profanity-laced materials to be freely given to children and worse. They asked me seconds. to stop sharing the flyers. I told them how frustrated I felt that the board doesn't care about the concerns of a large and growing group of people in our community, that Tony Jones has a history of ignoring problem parents, and it feels like the pattern is continuing in Greenwich. Worst of all, the board seems to be renegotiating Ms. Jones' contract in bad faith, ignoring feedback from parents, teachers, and administrators whose voices should be considered given our schools have dropped to a seven under the current leadership. It's time to wake up and respond to the community you were elected to represent. Time. Thank you. All right, the next speaker is Jane Anderson. Not seeing Jane. Jane, if you could raise your hand if you're online. Okay, we're going to move on. The next speaker is Francis Nobay. Can you hear me? Hang on one second, Francis. All right, Francis. Yep, ready? Yep. Good evening, Greenwich Board of Education. This is Francis Wunobe, co-chair PTAC Greenwich Remote School Special Committee, representing the more than 1,000 grade pre-K to grade 12 students still remote. Thank you to our GPS teachers for their continued efforts to engage and connect with our students in all modalities, especially the extremely challenging high flex modality. This month, our remote students are taking state SBA exams remotely. Thank you to our GPS teachers and administration for the virtual parent information session, the multiple student practice sessions, live tech help, and as needed, the option to take the tests in person. The tests are going as well as can be expected. The best part for me as a parent is hearing my third grader independently and proactively 
self-talk the questions out loud, and hear my fifth grade teacher encourage her students to get ready for the test with self-affirmations. I am a math person. I am great at tests. I persevere when I get stuck. If I need a break, I reach out. We got this. Before and after SBA testing, our grade K to five remote learners enjoyed virtual assemblies and curriculum link field trips thanks to the generosity of Greenwich Alliance for Education. And for grade five, a special thank you to the International School at Dundee who gave that program to our remote learners. These virtual programs have been seamlessly coordinated by remote school volunteers, Emily Brown, Anila Ahmad, and GPS staff, Anthony Stembian and Jacqueline Carlin. Thank you so much. Our remote learners are also grateful for continued efforts by the GPS school psychology team to offer virtual social clubs and parent chats to keep our mental health strong. As we look ahead to just five weeks of school, I'm truly amazed that we have made it this far with smiles and successes. Our remote school volunteers now turn our attention to re-entry and in-person reconnection with outdoor playdates and in-person moving up events. Special thanks to remote school volunteers, Eve Chen and Jana McQueen for year-end help. Thank you also to Brian Peldunas, Mimi Duff and the PTAC executive board and our 15 neighborhood school PTA presidents for supporting our remote learners this incredible year. We will finish the year strong. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, firstly, I just want to say thank you. I know this isn't an easy job. I was in education myself, and I know that these are unpaid positions, and, and it's not that I'm not appreciative. Number two, I want to say that I'm not anti-vax. <clears throat> that being said, it is my belief that due to poor leadership in this area of our country that our children have been needlessly forced to carry on the burden of COVID. They have absolutely been oppressed by authority as they have already lost a year and a half of their lives in terms of learning, physical activity, and socialization. I am disappointed that our district leaders have not done a better job advocating for our students in terms of making sure that they were returned to cl in class learning more quickly, do not fight for mask removals for them, and have not taken a position to protect them from the possibility of mandatory vaccinations. The truth is that the existing COVID vaccines are experimental. There is no way of knowing what the short and long-term effects will be. The responsibility and accountability of public health does not fall on experimenting with the healthy developing bodies of children. 78% of COVID hospital hospitalizations are the result of patients that have, co have compromised their own health by being overweight or having self-imposed respiratory issues. The solution is not to inject our children for the health of others, uh, especially a population for a great part that doesn't take their own health seriously enough to avoid this statistic. Honestly, when would that kind of logic end? When would the logic of experimenting on healthy children end then? Will we start drawing blood from school-aged children to, to better the chances of the greater good? Maybe harvest their skin or organs to save every life? Does it sound dramatic? It's the same concept. I'm sure we can even find scientists that would insist that doing so would be perfectly safe. Experimenting on our children for public health is not acceptable. And as district leaders, you should be defending our students not taking part in possible vaccination mandates. It has been a year and a half. Our children, lives, and bodies do not belong to the state, not to the CDC, not to WHO, not to NHI. Our children's bodies do not belong to herd immunity hopes or the greater good or what is best for the public health of a public that largely does not take their own health seriously enough to avoid such ailments. Our children's lives and bodies are not, op they're not available to anyone else to offer up and sacrifice on the altar of COVID or anything else. Our students are individuals and citizens and are not obligated to take on risk to provide for 
provide for or protect the health of anyone else. The possibilities of embracing such would be harrowing. Countless families around the country and in this district have voluntarily seconds. cooperated and complied with restrictions and sacrifices that they did not believe in out of kindness. That should not be confused with a forfeiture of rights. I believe that the decision to vaccinate children with COVID vaccine belongs to parents alone, and I hope that the school district stands by us. I implore you to use your positions to return a sense of freedom and dignity to our children and the families of Greenwich. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Kara Philbin. Kara Philbin. When do I start? Okay. The goal of Greenwich Public Schools and the BOE needs to be transparency in curriculum, and that means all learning materials for each grade across all schools that is accessible to parents three months in advance. The renewal of the superintendent contract can't be approved without teacher, student, parent, and community insight and input. A father in the GPS system for 15 years who I hold in the highest regard for consistently and reasonably advocating for a stronger education for all told me many years ago that every year the children learn less and less. In my 10 years, I can attest to this indeed being the case. Sadly, this father's voice and those of other parents have constantly fallen on deaf ears to no avail, voices silenced. GPS is always trying to pioneer the next big trend, green schools, or code for technology instead of paper, personalized learning, learning by technology instead of a teacher, and now SEL, code for social workers in school. GPS lost sight that education is meant to provide all students a neutral, safe place to build a foundation through skills that empower them to become their own individual critical thinker, not indoctrinated th through a critical lens. GPS used to be the gold standard, but now it's Hunger Games science standards borrowed from Stanford, replace Singapore math with free Eureka Engage math borrowed from New York State, who after investing millions ended the program after one year for curriculum and it was time, because there was no curriculum and it was time intensive to build one. A non-existent early literacy program and a special education system built on two key words, delay and deny. Forget the miseducation of the American boy. This is the miseducation of the Greenwich Public Schools. Administrators asked to read problematic views that discourage solution building and white fragility. Students asked to unpack their white privilege. Second graders learning that a naked man with an erect penis may ask you to touch it or put it in your mouth. Seventh learning about sorry ass bitches, clown whores, crotch ticks, and sequin strippers. Eighth about strapping down male parts, fantasizing about carrying a female's upstairs and tying her to a bed a necklace made out of tongues, extensive graphic descriptions of death, ninth, naked, naked breasts, young, old, conservative, recently raped, big, small, or mutilated genital or enhanced genitals, and especially rotting naked dead bodies. And 10th, women being gagged by a penis, her mascara mixed with tears, girls that need to be raped again, and the first time I ever saw, well, I'll let them learn that on their own. While district is ignoring pornographic curriculum to censor board members and facilitating unapproved by the FDA emergency use authorized jabs and COVID tests for money, the GPS education is broken. Not because of our wonderful teachers, so stop blaming them. This is a problem with programming, transparency, accountability, and leadership at the highest levels, district, union, BOE, PTAC, PTA. Our children deserve strong leaders of a healthy, unpartisan mindset who will choose the right choice, even if it's the harder choice. Leaders who will choose creative, engaging, engaging rigorous foundation and skill-based learning, free thought over critical lens, replace articles and videos Sorry, with text time. bots and thoughtfully selected and pre-approved learning materials and stop wasting Sorry, money time. on indoctrination Thank and technology like if securely, like submit your which comments. asks teachers to yeah. stop. You can submit the remainder of your comments to the board via email. Thank you very much. All right, the next speaker is Cheryl Resnick. Cheryl, if you're online, if you could raise your hand. Or you're in person. All right, great, come on down. 
Are we good? Okay. My husband and I have been residents of Greenwich for nearly 22 years. Our three children have all gone through the Greenwich public school system with our two oldest graduating from Greenwich High School. Our youngest will be entering 10th grade next year. Due to the uncertainty of the school's reopening this past fall of 2020, my husband and I enrolled our youngest daughter in a local private school where she attended her ninth grade year. We moved her out of GPS because of our concern about schools reopening for in-person learning. In addition, and just as important, we were concerned to hear statements from the Connecticut Teachers Union where they only mentioned the safety of the teachers and rarely, if ever, mentioned the word student and their concerns for going back to school. Granted, I know that Teachers Union represents teachers and not students. However, teachers wouldn't have their jobs without having students in their classroom. It appeared as though the Connecticut Teachers Union was becoming even more politicized as many teachers unions around the country were as well. However, for the upcoming 2021-22 school year, our daughter strongly wants to leave her private school and go to Greenwich High School where many of her friends are and where she feels she can speak more freely and have a healthy debate on various topics among her teachers and peers. My husband and I really hope that she will experience the same lively open school environment that our two siblings experience at GHS, but we do have concerns about the curriculum issues, the push to vaccinate children for a vaccine that has not been FDA approved, the loss of being able to claim religious exemption for non-grandfathered -grand exempted students, mass mandates, et cetera. For the sake of our children and for our community, we need to show them our state and even our nation that we can work together as one to be transparent about our children's curriculum and listen to one another in all areas, including our children's health. I feel the need to remind everyone about a challenging time in our GPS history. In 2013, I was PTA co-president of an elementary school in town, one that had significant free and reduced lunch population. During that time, the town was faced with a categorization by the Connecticut Department of Education that some Greenwich schools were, quote, racially imbalanced, my children's elementary school being one of them. The GPS Board of Ed and the superintendent, together with the school's PTAs, fought this categorization of our school district and worked together very well. It was wonderful to see the community come together on this issue. The GPS did not see students based on their skin color, as the Connecticut Department of Ed did in Hartford. Rather, parents pointed out that the town's diversity existed in how many people were from countries around the world, which actually made our town racially balanced compared to many districts seconds. in the state. In conclusion, I hope that the same level of cooperation will occur among the district, the BOE, the PTAs, and the Greenwich community during this polarized environment that we are currently facing. Let's be an example to our children of what healthy debating and working together looks like. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, the next speaker is Janet Stone McGuigan. Okay, Janet. Great, can you hear me? Yep. I'm Janet Stone McWiggin, um, but I'm actually going to speak on behalf of Janet McMahon who can't attend tonight, but it goes without saying that I agree with um, what I'm about to say. Dear members of the Board of Education, I am unable to attend Thursday's meeting, but would like to express my family's full and emphatic support of Dr. Jones's well-deserved salary increase and the maximum extension of her contract, which I understand is three years in the industry. I urge all members of the Board of Education to do so as well. As a GPS parent for the past seven years, I have personally seen two superintendents and two interim superintendents come and go. It is no secret that Greenwich has a revolving door of superintendents and in fact, Dr. Jones is our 12th superintendent in 20 years. Since 1990, there have been nine superintendents and eight interims for an average tenure of 1.8 years. Since 2009, there have been four superintendents and three interims for an average tenure of 1.7 years. I think we can all agree that this high superintendent turnover has set our district and town back significantly over the last few decades. We are now presented with the opportunity for stability, continuity, and success under Dr. Jones, and we must seize it. During Dr. Jones's 22 month tenure, we have also been the beneficiaries of her numerous and tremendous accomplishments. The most important of which was her measured, reasonable and calculated response to the global pandemic. You'll recall that Dr. Jones began her tenure a mere eight months before coronavirus upended the world. Not an easy feat for anyone, but Dr. Jones took everything in stride and rose to the occasion. 
When schools shuttered on March 11th, Dr. Jones mobilized around 1,000 teachers and staff and around 9,000 students to pivot to the then unheard of distance learning literally overnight. And over the summer, no one worked harder than Dr. Jones to ensure that our students returned back to school in person safely. To accommodate remote learners, Dr. Jones architected and executed a robust remote school so that no children was left behind. Greenwich was a leader in the state and nation in this regard, and we will continue to be pioneers in educational challenges with Dr. Jones at our helm. In short, we are infinitely lucky to have Dr. Jones leading Greenwich Public Schools and voting to approve her salary increase and extend her contract three years would be a genuine symbol of support and a vote of confidence in her work. Please vote yes on this item. On another note, please also vote yes to the North Miami School interim appropriation request. It has been well over three months since the ceiling collapsed and students continue to ride an hour long or over bus rides to get to other area schools and or parents are driving 40 minutes each way to get to alternate school sites with no foreseeable end in sight. Our priority should be to get them back to their home school as expeditiously as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Stephanie Cowie. I think you're also online. Hi, good evening, Hi. Sharon Bernstein. Hello? Once. Hold on one second. Oh, no problem. All right, Steph, I'm ready for you. Okay, great, thanks. Good evening, Chairman Bernstein, Superintendent Dr. Jones and Board of Ed members. I'm Steph Cowie and Terry Lamontia and I, as you know, are the co-presidents at Greenwich High School. We're so thankful to see our seniors and juniors back in school full time and for our sophomores and freshmen later this month. We look forward to seeing all of our seniors and their families as we, the PTA, Greenwich High School teachers, administration, and Board of Ed celebrate their well-deserved graduation. We are most thankful to all of you in that room, Principal Ralph Mayo, our Greenwich High School teachers and staff for keeping our kids safe and in school. Congratulations to senior Colin Speaker, who was awarded the United States Presidential Scholar. It is a truly remarkable and an extraordinary achievement. We also would like to congratulate our winter all-state student athletes, our all-state musicians, and math team state championship. Congratulations to all of you. You are truly an outstanding group of Greenwich High School students. The Greenwich High School Vestibule Committee interviewed architectural firms this week, and through this work as a committee, we believe the end product will be a wonderful balance between security and design. Additionally, we would like to share our disappointment about the most recent delay to Cardinal Stadium due to the tree wardens ruling on Monday. This has been a blow to all of our student athletes, our parents and community. We want you to know, we support all of the Board of Ed efforts as you navigate through this delay. Completion of the stadium means more to anyone in this, in this community. One moment. Additionally, sorry, we would be remiss if we didn't mention one last Congratulations, and that is to Dr. Tony Jones and her team for an outstanding year during an unprecedented times. While nothing is perfect, she and her team executed the impossible. Our elementary and middle school children have been in school full time since September with remote school available to all. Greenwich High School executed a hybrid schedule, two cohorts, Greenwich and Cardinals, to alternate in-person and remote learning, supporting close to 2,800 students. In comparison to our peer schools in Connecticut, the majority of those districts were fully remote. There was no playbook at the start of this pandemic last spring and no one would have thought we would just be coming out of this pandemic today. Dr. Jones is steadfast in her decisions. Communications for the, from the district were consistent and easily accessible. And I might note this has been the first time in quite some time. Dr. Jones has executed under tremendous pressure with grace. We are in support of Dr. Tony Jones's contract renewal. Dr. Jones, thank you for your leadership. We thank you all for your continued efforts and support of our children, faculty and administrators, and look forward to our students being back in school in the fall. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Leela Horn. 
Silva, if you're online, if you could raise your hand. She won't be speaking. We're, we just covered it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so we're gonna move on to our next speaker, Wendy Walsh. The federal government is expected to pressure schools to adopt critical race theory and anti-racism practices into our schools. Is Greenwich going along with this? These policies are imposing toxic new curricula and forcing our children into divisive identity groups based on race, ethnicity, religion, and gender. This new educational mission derived from Marxism divides our children into oppressor and oppressed groups. To one group, it teaches guilt and shame, and to the other, grievance and anger. But to all children, it spreads unhappiness, radicalism, and failure. Critical race theory and anti-racism teaching practices are racist, hateful, abusive, and divisive at their core. There is no place for this in our schools. Let's not so easily abandon the wisdom of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr that one should be judged not by the color of their skin, but rather the content of their character. One goal of the GPS and the BOE needs to be transparency in the curriculum, not just in standards and benchmarks. Parents need access to actual lessons, learning materials and resources such as videos, speeches and print across all schools and grade levels. We should be able to see these, these materials up to three months in advance. Why? Because we have serious concerns based on what we've heard from tonight. With regard to the new three-year contract for our superintendent, the BOE, the BOE needs teacher, parent, and student feedback before renewing her three-year contract. Where is the survey from the community? This board should not be determining the superintendent as three BOE members are not seeking reelection. If you are going to disregard the above, then at the very least sign a six month to a one year renewal, which will give the superintendent at least a year to plan accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is David Lancaster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is uh, David Lancaster and I'm a native of Greenwich and I've lived in this great town my entire life as, my, as did my parents and grandparents before me. I also attended Greenwich Public Schools during most of my youth. I've never spoken in a public forum about educational issues, but felt compelled to do so about critical race theory, which is being considered as part of the educational cur curriculum here in Greenwich. Critical race theory is an ideology predicated on the idea that American society was founded on racism, not liberty. It is nothing more than repackaged market Marxist orthodoxy. Classical Marxism describes society as an economic conflict between two classes, workers, the proletariat and capitalists, the oppressed and the oppressors. With CRT, people are now classified according to the color of their skin rather than their economic status. White privilege is the new evil like capitalism was once was. And if you disagree with this, you're suffering from white denial. Again, shutting down debate. Yet the ultimate goals are the same the elimination of private property, free speech, and the overthrow of a free society, society starting with the brainwashing of the young. Make no mistake, the intellectuals who propose this latest Marxist brew have no use for this country and its Western Judeo-Christian values. The only thing that has changed is their vocabulary using words like equity, social justice, and diversity. The sad irony of this discussion that we're having is that we've we, had we been taught more properly, which means with historical accuracy about the evils of Marxism and the great historical uniqueness of the American idea, as well as the benefits this nation has conferred on mankind, we might, might not even be discussing the possibility of this latest Marxist mutation being brought into our schools, given the wreckage this poisonous idea has inflicted upon humanity. 
The idea that American was born out of racism is not only ahistorical, but completely antithetical to the country's founding principles expressed in the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights and the persistent striving of men like Dr. King to create a colorblind society based on the enlightenment principles of liberty and the respect for the dignity of every person against the power of the state. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the board, there will not, there will not be enough legal reserves on the books of the town of Greenwich to defend against the lawsuits that will result if this twisted and racist cur curriculum is implemented. Lawsuits are being filed across the country against schools that impose this theory on students on the grounds of the First Amendment, which protects citizens from compelled speech, the 14th Amendment, which provides equal protection under the law, and the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits public institutions from dis discriminating based on race. 30 seconds. Let us teach our children the whole truth about America. Let us talk about the injustices amid the real progress that has been made and the blood has been shed to secure the blessing liberty, blessings of liberty for all. The stories of the of the noble sacrifices of men and women of all colors in creating this great land can lift the hearts and minds of our children rather than the dark nihilistic ideology whose goal is not justice but division and ultimately destruction. Lastly, I recommend that this town not renew the contract of the current superintendent of schools for another term, however short or long. Thank you for your time. Uh, Greg Piccanino. Hi, I'm Greg Piccanino. I have prepared comments, but uh, two things I would like to say is I was educated in the United States. <clears throat> I know how great this country is. I know I was taught that Marxism was bad. I thought May 1st was commie day. It wasn't International Labor Day. I also was educated to look at truth and real information. So the people who think the state cannot mandate vaccines should go to the United States Supreme Court website and look up Jacobson versus Massachusetts, because it very much is in the domain of public health and the right of government to mandate vaccines. Now, no. I, didn't boo, respectful. I didn't boo anybody. So I'm Greg Piccinino. I lived in Greenwich since 2006. We decided to move to the suburbs. We looked at Rye and Greenwich, and we chose Greenwich for the balance of good schools, reasonable taxes, and a more diverse community. We never regretted that choice. However, we've been perplexed at the revolving door of superintendents. And here we are tonight, once again, attacking our latest superintendent, Dr. Jones. Full disclosure, when the opening arose, I lobbied the Board of Education for Mr. Mayo. The board chose to hire Dr. Jones, and I can't find any public information to question her performance. She joined in January 2019, and like every super, she's been questioned and micromanaged by the BOE and the community endlessly. As far as I can see, there's no valid assessment that's been made public to say that she's not doing a good job. And in fact, I would suggest the public information I've seen supports the idea that she is doing a good job. I'll talk about her COVID response, but that's not all she's done. She worked with special education families, conducted an independent audit of the program, and is making changes. She cut $3 million overnight from the budget as the BT requested without impacting education quality and curriculum, honestly. Does anybody think any superintendent who's been on this job for a year and a half can get a handle on curriculum when they're busy dealing with our town's processes? Um, when COVID closed us down overnight, she moved the system from in-school to remote in less than a week. And while I was not in love with the system, I have to say we did get it right eventually. She also got the school system ready for this year. And Greenwich was one of the few districts that had K-8 to in-school option. And then the first day of September, we're the envy of my friends in Darien, New Canaan, et cetera. Recently, there's been an uproar about some inappropriate materials shown in class. And while not defending the lurid video, uh, I'm gonna go right to the chase. At what point do we acknowledge that the problem may not be the person in the super, the super seat, but our ineffectual, ineffectual and dysfunctional system of student government and oversight? The supers have come and gone and the constant element has been us, the political parties, the voters. Let's look in the mirror and see who's at fault. And unless there's a real reason that is unknown to the community to attack Time. Dr. Jones, 
I would say we're playing petty politics. Thank you very much. Very All right. Our next speaker is Ethan Cooper. Ethan, you're online. If you give us one second to get you set up. Hey, Ethan, you there, bud? Uh, hello. All right, we got you. Whenever you're ready. All right. Good evening, Chairman Bernstein, Dr. Jones, and members of the Board of Education. My name is Ethan Cooper, and I'm in eighth grade at Central Middle School. Over the last few months, I've been researching mental health as part of my capstone project. This is a serious issue worldwide. Studies show that two out of three teenagers have suffered depression or anxiety during the pandemic. The mental health crisis that has been raging through the teen population for the past 14 months is a pandemic of its own. Closures, masks, and social distancing have disrupted critical developmental years in the teen's life. As part of my capstone, I surveyed my peers about their mental health during the pandemic. I would like to share some of the results with you. When asked what emotions these students had experienced the most over the past year, 64% reported sadness as the dominant emotion. 47% reported a decline in their personal mental health over the past year while only 8% reported the opposite. Yet, only 18% said that they would be comfortable asking for mental health help. The Board of Education and the District have provided my middle school with extensive mental health resources, including social emotional learning. But my survey suggests that many students don't feel comfortable utilizing these resources. One of the main factors that is stopping teens from getting the help they need is the stigma, especially among teens, that is associated with mental health. Mental health is not much different than physical health, yet in a teenage mind, breaking an arm and getting a cast is a sign of bravery. In contrast, expressing the pain you feel inside is a form of weakness. Until the stigma is broken, and until more than 18% of students are will willing to utilize the resources that are provided to them by the district, we will not be able to meaningfully address teen mental health issues in our community. We need to find ways to help students better understand their mental and emotional health is not something to be ashamed of then students will be more likely to take advantage of the resources made available through our schools. As a result, schools' efforts to help students with their mental health will be far more likely to have an impact. We need to change the norm and open the way for teenagers to get the help they need, comfortably and shamelessly. This can only be done together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ethan. Always important to hear from students, and this is a very important topic for us. We appreciate your comments. All right, next up is Carrie Huxta. Hi, can you hear me? Ready for you, Carrie. Okay, good evening, Board of Ed members and Dr. Jones. I'd like to express my deep concern over the recent unfortunate events surrounding our curriculum. To say that we rely on teacher judgment is not enough. There are an abundance of problematic examples and to say they are isolated is not correct. I was also infuriated when I came across a copy of the white privilege survey in the Greenwich Times. Why was the title of the document changed from Macintosh survey to I can? When the Board of Ed asked Dr. Jones for a copy of the assignment, why was it altered from the original copy given to students? Why was this survey only given in one class at one school? I have asked very simple, straightforward questions and my emails and phone calls have gone unanswered. What does it say to parents when the administration does not respond? It creates distrust. These days, one cannot turn on the news without hearing about yet another school district fighting over the curriculum. I love my community and I do not want to see Greenwich on the news because we were unable to work together to provide a solid, meaningful, healthy education. We should be proactive and discuss these controversial topics as a community and let the families of Greenwich decide what is best for our children. We need to find a balance that teaches important topics without politicizing it and without making students feel bad about themselves. If the district would simply provide transparency, much of this can be prevented. It should not take parents like myself several weeks to obtain a copy of their child's curriculum. Also, the lessons being taught across our classrooms should be consistent with one another from classroom to classroom and from school to school. We need to prepare our children for a global economy. How are our students going to compete with others who attend private schools down the road who are learning the map of the United States, cursive writing, and mastery of long division? 
Our students do not have a strong understanding of grammar and spelling. They depend on technology to correct it. The failure to educate our children on these important topics will only further divide our students' abilities. The world has passed us by for years on math, and we are now letting it happen with English and communication. We are raising an illiterate generation who cannot communicate effectively. Perhaps if more time was spent in English, on literature, grammar, spelling, writing, reading, and less time on privileged surveys, TED Talks on oppression, and YouTube videos on Feminist Fridays, our children would be in a better place academically and emotionally. I respectfully ask that you work together as a team, put your political differences aside, and put together a comprehensive curriculum that is consistent, transparent, unbiased, and prepares our students to compete intellectually with the world. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barbara O'Neill. Good evening, Chairman Bernstein, board members, Dr. Jones. I'm here to congratulate Dr. Jones in advance of the vote to extend her contract. Over a span of 46 years, I've been associated with the Greenwich Public Schools as teacher, administrator, member of the Board of Education for eight years, and chair for two, and now as member of the RTM Education Committee. During this time, I have worked with over 20 superintendents dating back to before Dr. Fleischman. So I know the qualities required of an outstanding superintendent. Dr. Jones exhibits those essential leadership qualities, including the ability to communicate effectively and the willingness to listen and adapt. In addition, she is resilient and remains positive even when faced with the refusal of the BET to fund various capital projects and with BET budget guidelines that among other things don't permit the hiring of essential custodians and mental health personnel. Among her many accomplishments, Dr. Jones initiated a long overdue SPED report, demonstrated support for the ALP program, addressed the need for social workers in our elementary schools, and revitalized the summer school program. She also closed out several lingering capital projects created greater transparency in the budget process, and won the confidence of the BET with prompt and comprehensive reporting. But above all, Dr. Jones kept our schools open and our students safe during COVID. This permitted students to continue their education and maintain their social interactions, which is critical to their social emotional health. This was an enormous achievement requiring working 24 seven to keep logistics and communication protocols appropriate for the constantly changing COVID environment. Clearly, Dr. Jones has an incredible work ethic. Not only does she put in a very full day, she attends over, <coughs> excuse me, on over 160 meetings in the evening. Continuity and leadership benefits all our students, for we know no superintendent can initiate, sustain, initiate sustainable change in one term. Systemic change requires time to evaluate what is in place, to build a strong academic team and develop rig rigorous academic programs. I applaud the board in advance for seconds. voting to extend Dr. Jones's contract. The vote should be unanimous to demonstrate support for her excellent work and to encourage Dr. Jones to continue on in the Greenwich Public Schools. The community and all the town governing bodies should join the board in supporting the work of Dr. Jones. The alternative is to revert to a revolving door of superintendents. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, the next speaker is Aaron Hull. Aaron, if you're online, if you could raise your hand. All right, so we're gonna move on then. Uh, our next speaker is Anna Laborde. Anna, give us a second, she's up. Can you hear me? Ready to go. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening. My name is Anna Laborde and I, along with Jessica and Wright Polinish, am speaking again tonight on behalf of PTAC's Academic Excellence Committee in regards to curriculum in our schools. 
Given the public comments at the previous BOE meeting and in light of recent efforts by some in our community, we wanted to reiterate and further express our support for GPS's teachers. As a PTAC committee, we continue to strive for consistency, transparency, and excellence in our school system. Again, we would like to express our gratitude for our teachers and their expertise. They are the experts. Our hope for a transparent process and curriculum from grades K through 12. Our need for consistency in that curriculum within grades and across school buildings. Our belief that Greenwich has and can continue to offer an excellent academic experience for all students, given that we work together respectfully. We believe that with consistent and transparent leadership, our teachers can receive the support, materials, and resources they need to continue to help our students excel. While we do not want administrators nor the BOE to micromanage our classrooms, we have come to understand that GPS teachers have been looking for and are deserving of consistent leadership and support within GPS and within the broader community. In particular, GPS needs to offer a comprehensive suite of curriculum materials, resources, and accompanying professional development, particularly at the K-5 level. This must be a priority in both initiative and budget if we are to allow our outstanding teachers to reach their full potential and educate our students to the best of their ability. As a PTAC committee, it is our understanding and hope that Mr. D'Amico and Superintendent Jones also endeavor to offer a consistent, transparent, and excellent academic education, complete with curriculum and resources provided to GPS teachers and communicated to and transparent for GPS families. The recent incidents have brought our curriculum to the forefront of the conversation in Greenwich. It is up to us as a community of educators and parents to capitalize on this moment by working together with mutual respect and direct communication in order to further the goals of consistency, transparency, and excellence in GPS. Our PTAC committee will continue our dialogue and work with parents, district leadership, and the GEA to further these goals. And we hope that the Board of Education, along with the BET and RTM, will join us in working collaboratively to make our curriculum a priority, particularly in its financial planning and support of consistent leadership in GPS. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Megan Galetta. Thank you. Thank you, BOE members. Thank you for listening to the concerned parents of the GPS community sitting before you this evening. I have raised four children in the GPS community since 2001. Greenwich has long been known as a diverse community with excellent schools and a driven, dedicated, supportive, administrative, and teaching staff. And I have to say, sadly, we are a far cry from where we used to be. We have always been sought out by families all over the country and internationally as a great place to raise a family with high academic standards, strong parental involvement, and support of students of all learning levels. I am speaking today regarding my deep concern about the dramatic shift our district has taken over the past two years. I am very entrenched in the community and I speak on behalf of many, many parents in the district. Here are our shared concerns. The district has placed a wedge in between the students and parents by communicating directly with the students. This is not acceptable and it must stop. There, have been a, there has been a major shift in the curriculum over the past two years by introducing explicit, inappropriate, and divisive narratives. We do not raise our children to hate, question, denounce, or apologize for their race, gender, ethnicity, social status, etc. Our curriculum has, not, has been shaped around these harmful narratives, including anti-American, critical race theory, revisionist history, based on 1619 Project, which pushes divisiveness in very sneaky and misleading ways. We, the informed parents of Greenwich, want this to stop immediately. Curriculum should be transparent to the parents in the community as it once was. All new curriculum programs should be made known to the GPS community and surveys and communication should once again be shared with the parents in advance and voted upon. I am deeply concerned regarding the stance this district has taken with the experimental vaccines and Greenwich schools being used as vaccination clinics. 
I am not an anti-vaxxer. All of my children are fully vaccinated. All I am for full transparency and for freedom and privacy to choose what is best for individuals. I do not support our schools as being used as vaccination clinics. This is placing extreme and undue pressure on our children. Our district has consistently positioned all of the experimental vaccines still under EUA as approved, which is completely misleading and has been communicated to the the GPS community. The GPS has been extremely irresponsible and misleading in the weekly communications. The emails are coercive by suggesting that a vaccinated community will help us get back to normal. Once again, this is irresponsible move by the administration and the board. With all the horrific incidents um, and including death in adults and teens who have gotten vaccinated, has anyone even considered the liability and implications if something potentially Time. harmful happened to a student on Thank school property? Much. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, we're trying to get everybody in. If, if we can't get everybody in, we'll have to extend the, the comments to the end of the meeting. So please be respectful. All right, next up, Jessica Maloney. All right, Jessica, give us. Ready to go, Jess. Jessica. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening. I am addressing you today with concerns about the use of the Greenwich Middle Schools and High Schools and High School as locations for the Family Centers of Greenwich to vaccinate students as young as 12. The FDA lists many medical complications as possible side effects of these vac- vaccines, such as meningitis, transverse myelitis, encephalitis, stroke, seizures, narcolepsy, myocarditis, and pericarditis, to name a few. In fact, the US government has vaccine adverse events reporting system to which such reactions can be reported. And as of last Friday, about 193,000 total adverse events have been reported, including 4,057 deaths and 17,190 serious injuries. The emergency use authorization of the Pfizer vaccine for children aged 12 to 15 was based on about six months of safety data and a severely underpowered study with less than 2,500 2,500 participants. Emergency youth authorization allows the FDA to authorize the use of unapproved medical products to treat or prevent serious or life-threatening diseases and requires that the known and potential benefits of the intervention are balanced against the known or potential harms. The Pfizer vaccine clinical trials in both adults and children did not prove that this intervention prevents people from contracting COVID or transmitting COVID to other people. We also know that children are at minimal risk from COVID-19. According to our government's own statistics, people aged zero to 14 years have a 99.9998% survival rate, and people 15 to 44 years of age have a 99.993% survival rate. Since children are at little risk from COVID, since the list of possible side effects is long, since the shots have not been proven to prevent the contraction or transmission of COVID, and since there is very little short-term and no long-term safety data in children, the emergency use authorization of this product for children is not warranted and should not be promoted by our town's Department of Health or our school district. There is absolutely no emergency when it comes to children. If parents would like to vaccinate their children against COVID-19, they can make an appointment with their pediatrician or one of the pharmacies in town. Children see their schools as a trustworthy, safe place. Our schools should not be promoting experimental medical products with very limited short-term safety testing and absolutely no long-term safety data. A school clinic sends a message to children that these are extremely safe products Mm -hmm. that should be used to protect our school community. This should be a private medical decision for each family with no involvement from the public schools. Please reconsider using the... the, um, the middle schools as vaccination clinics in the upcoming weeks. Thank you. Right, next speaker is Marla Beer. Hi, I'm Hello. here. One second, Marla. Okay. Okay, all set. 
Okay, I come to you tonight as the parent to five GPS students. The majority of our children ha have had an outstanding experience from elementary through GHS. However, tonight I bring forth serious concerns regarding our daughter who has a severe learning disability. Throughout her time at her Greenwich Middle School, specifically in grades seven and eight, we've repeatedly voiced our growing concerns about our daughter's lack of progress. These concerns were reinforced by our daughter's history of low testing scores on each state mandated assessment since elementary school, her inability to complete homework, necessity to take tests and quizzes over protracted periods of time, and difficulties completing projects. When our daughter entered middle school, she was evaluated by the GPS team and was found to be at a fourth grade working level. She was placed into a non-collaborative classroom with many other children who in addition had behavioral challenges. This placement was not in the LRE, the least restrictive environment as required under the IDEA. Today, as she prepares to leave her middle school, she is working at a grade four month five level according to her IEP dated March 8, 2021, essentially graduating, having made only five months of progress over a three-year period. In fairness, she completed grade six on grade level, but due to inefficient special ed support, has in fact regressed significantly. In addition, just this past year, our daughter's special ed instructional hours were lowered by two thirds from 13.12 to 3.75 hours. This was done by the principal despite our daughter's continued low scores and ongoing learning challenges. It is abundantly clear that our daughter is not ready to move on to GHS as she is currently 4.5 years scholastically behind her peers. Despite her receiving all A's and a handful of B's during her time at middle school, her state testing points to a vastly different set of circumstances. We believe that the GPS staff who are trained professionals in good conscience recognize this as well. Despite our daughter's very clear needs, the GPS PPT team has stated that our daughter is ready to matriculate to Greenwich High with minimal support and does not require being in a specialized school trained in her specific deficiencies. As parents, it's devastating to think that GPS will have denied our daughter the opportunity for a higher level college education and success as a productive adult. Our daughter's middle school has also refrained from offering her additional services such as reading comprehension and one-to-one -one support, instead choosing to allow her to essentially regress to a fourth grade working level. Now attempting to pass her on to Greenwich High to effectively make her their problem. We are pleading with you to please create transparency and partner with families to find outplacements when GPS cannot service a student. I promise you this forthright approach will alleviate the countless issues surrounding our special education program, respectfully yours. Thank you. Board members know we've got five more speakers. I think we ought to take them all before we close this out. Uh, and the next speaker is Allison Buck. Allison, if you're online, could you raise your hand? Allison, so we're going to move on to our next speaker, Wendy Day. Michael, do we have a windy day? Wendy, if you're with us, if you could raise your hand. I do not see her online. Okay, not seeing Wendy, so we'll move on. The next speaker is Ashley Newey. Good evening. I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of every child in the Greenwich Public School System. What is being presented and taught to our children in our schools is appalling and disgusting. At Greenwich High School, 10th graders were, <clears throat> were assigned to read a pamphlet entitled The Miseducation of the American Boy. It is essentially a primer on what is wrong with boys. The language and graphic nature of topics is absolutely not suitable to be taught in school. Here are some examples. My apologies ahead of time. It's hysterical to surprise a buddy with a meme where a woman is being gagged by, by a penis, her mascara mixed with her tears. He may or may not send a funny text to friends about girls that need to be raped. We definitely say fuck a lot and we call each other pussies and bitches. The first time I ever saw a vagina, stick your finger up there and make the come here motion. Any questions from the board? 
It's very uncomfortable, isn't it? How do you think the children and the teachers felt teaching this and reading it? Perhaps you should start questioning the community feedback on hiring decisions and stop blaming our beloved teachers for the leadership issues. Starting tomorrow, please provide materials to parents three months in advance. GPS leadership who chooses to allow students to benefit from the therapy of rigor, not leaders who disadvantage our students' ability to learn and compete with neighboring districts for college spots. By not teaching for three and a half months last year, New Canaan and Darien were. One month in COVID, into COVID, instructing teachers to make themselves available one time per week, not to teach, but to check on the welfare of children. Each instructing teachers to give homework if necessary this year. No midterms or finals. We'd like to move on, so if you could please, thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Ken Shalcross. Ken, if you're online, please raise your hand. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me okay? All right, Ken, we're ready. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so thank much. You so much. Thank you for your time. I'll, I'll make this really quick. I just want to clarify for everyone in attendance, attendance that Feminist, feminist Friday, Friday, not part, part of any seventh grade, grade class or curriculum, curriculum. It's been, mentioned it's been mentioned numerous, numerous times, times tonight. tonight. Don't know why, but I want to reiterate it is not happening in the Greenwich Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hello? Just hold on one minute and we'll get you uh, on, on the microphone. That they'll loosen that, I think, going into next year. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's not working. Can, yeah, can folks online hear Dr. Jones? Yes. We, we closed the yes. recording, and I'm, I'm sorry, that was just too late. We'd, we'd asked for them to be recognized earlier. Um, can, sorry. Um, so our graduation, we are excited this year that our graduation um, will be in person on June 21st. The rain date is the 22nd. And the graduation will be on field six and seven so that we have two uh, full-size football fields so that we can social distance and have a good number of the family members in attendance, not limiting to just one or two, which was really important um, to the students. Um, I, the mask guidance, I, that was after, so I need to keep going right. Um, 
So they did issue universal mask uh, guidance today from the state of Connecticut um, Department of Education. And they are saying that the current rule requiring universal mask uh, will stay in place uh, for at this time. And um, this is part of the governor's order as well as the Connecticut Department of Health. And they will continue to evaluate as we go into the summer. But we did get that direct guidance because it's been a little confusing with the community opening up um, and people are asking what's happening in schools. Um, we also have a, an update to our reopening document, which will be posted in the next week. And that is a requirement coming from the federal government that goes along with our ARP or SR3 funding. They just shared that with us last week. And we have to update our opening document every six months. Because we've already been open, it's a little late for us. We did it last summer, uh, but there are a lot of districts across the country that didn't go through that process. So they're requiring it of all of us in order to get the access to that funding. And when you see ours and the way that it's posted online, it's pretty short. Uh, we are anticipating a normal opening going into the fall, and we will be watching all summer to see if we need to pivot according to what's happening um, with COVID over the summer. Um, we do have with our ARP funding, just so people know, we have to get broad community input uh, through town hall surveys, a variety of ways um, in order to access that funding. They have set the deadline for that um, to start uh, next week. The application opens uh, with the Connecticut State Department of Education and it will have to be submitted in August. So a lot of this input will take place in the summer and we will encourage the community to uh, act on that. And that's all for me, Mr. Princey. Okay, thank you very much. All right, next up is the reports of officers, committees, and liaisons. Oh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Jones, thank you for the update. Um, I have a couple questions about um, the things in your report. One was, I, I was unclear from the state, is it guidance or is it a rule? I mean, you can, I, I kept hearing the word guidance, so I didn't know if it's, a mandate or it's guidance from the state to districts? Do you, do you know? And I just got this this afternoon. So I'm going to read um, exactly it, it's what It's okay. I mean, if you'd rather digest it and send me. Well, it, it's pretty clear because it says adapt, advance, achieve, which is the Connecticut plan uh, to learn and grow is requiring all students and staff to wear a face mask when inside a school building with limited exceptions. Um, and then down on the bottom, again, it's in bold, therefore the current rule, and it is a rule requiring universal mask wearing for all individuals in all school buildings will remain in place at this time. What, um, they what do are the have exceptions? a section, excuse me, let me just, I have one more piece. They do have a section um, about outside and we're gonna review that tomorrow to see mm -hmm. if maybe during recess and some areas like that, we might be able to be a little bit looser. Um, but again, that this came today. Okay, so, and what were the exceptions? Well, if a student has like um, a health uh, condition and they have something on file with the nurse, that has been since the beginning of the year. Okay, and my, my other question was, uh, I, I, the, these vaccine clinics, um, I, I guess I have a couple questions. Um, why did, why do we have family? Why did we invite family centers into our schools to to dispense vaccines? Um, we're, we're it's not really us. It is family centers that issues that they set up the clinics. And again, since the very beginning of the immunization, most of our staff went to other schools. Schools. This is uh, the only clinics that we have hosted. We're doing one at each school. Um, and it is a service to our families that want to take advantage of that service. And again, a lot of our staff were at Brunswick. There are probably people up here that went to Brunswick School, that went to Bridgeport High School. Uh, this is the way that the state has implemented the vaccine since day one. We just didn't have this opportunity earlier um, for our staff. And our staff actually wanted it. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I probably didn't ask my question correctly. Um, because I, I understood our staff was long ago vaccinated because we set up, uh, there were special clinics that were set up specifically for teachers. Sites were available to them when it wasn't available to the general public. Like Brunswick, as an example, Brunswick wasn't available to me when it first came out and the general public, it wasn't available. So I know our staff was long ago uh, available. I, I guess these clinics, these, have these clinics gone in recently? When did they go in? 
We only we are only hosting one clinic. Uh, we did the high school today. Okay. We will have one at each middle school. And again, that's Is it only a one day thing. Said, pardon? It's a one day thing. Yes, it's one time. It starts late in the day, goes until about five o'clock. And uh-huh. we have families that, you know, they don't have a car. They can't just drive to a clinic. There, there are families that want to take advantage of this. I don't expect it to be large. Uh-huh. Um, I think today, the high school, we had about 35 students that took access, but those families uh, needed the assistance. Okay. Are they, um, are we going to do any more? Are you planning any more of these? Um, not at this time, no. But we'll have everybody, the age, the age group actually now is from 12 to 16. So we've offered, they, there have been ample opportunities for people to get vaccinated. So I don't see that we'll need to offer any more. Definitely between now and the end of the year. Uh, okay. Thank you. For- Go ahead, Joe. I have a question on that. Did we make this decision to do these clinics based on demand? Uh, have the uh, parents of the children contacted us and said, hey, could we somehow maybe set up a clinic at the, uh, uh, at the school and, uh, and uh, maybe facilitate the inability for them to, uh, uh, to go for the uh, uh, vaccine? I would have to ask our head of nursing that and uh, the Department of Health, like what decision making was on the back end of that. But I do believe that their, you know, parents have asked us and been very grateful for us helping them know where they can get these vaccines, when they are given. Um, and certainly they, again, they've utilized schools, this entire vaccine process. Um, so we believe it is a benefit to our families that want to take advantage. Thank you. And I have a follow-up question. Uh, do uh, the other schools outside our district, uh, Darien, New Canaan, there was some reference made to those. Are they also hosting clinics in their districts? Um, most of them, yes. And we were actually criticized early in the vaccine because we didn't do, do that um, at our school sites. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd ask the audience to please not uh, comment. We're in the middle of our actual board meeting. All right, we're going to move on then to reports of officers, committees, and liaisons. So are there any members that have anything to report? Ms. Stowe. Just to provide a little follow-up to um, Dr. Jones pointing out about the $9.5 million, um, that the American Rescue Plan is um, thankfully giving to Greenwich Public Schools. We are taking it up as a budget committee next Wednesday morning so we can start working with the administration on gathering community and staff input. And um, obviously that will be posted shortly, so we welcome people coming and to our meeting, and then of course we'll report back to the board. Mr. Kelly. Well, I usually like uh, presenting good news, but I've got a mix of good news and bad news. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about the Cardinal Stadium project. Uh, the good news is uh, the foundations are in, uh, they're uh, where we need them to be, they're complete. They're now ready for the delivery in June of the actual bleachers themselves, which will be coming in erected quite quickly and uh, uh, will be in place. Uh, We'll see significant improvement in Cardinal Stadium uh, by the end of June. Uh, Unfortunately, we have some bad news. Uh, Well, the bad news is kind of devastating at this point. We're just trying to digest it now. uh, And it's kind of really kind of hard to talk about, but I'm gonna try to explain it as clearly as I can. The, uh, uh, I personally have attended uh, about 100 meetings in the last year and a half regarding Cardinal Stadium. Uh, we've been with the DPW, the Architecture Review Board, uh, Planning and Zoning, uh, the Selectmen Committees, all other committees, groups that wanted to have questions or had questions about Cardinal Stadium. Every two weeks, we had a staff meeting uh, talking about the progress of, uh, of this, uh, uh, this project. We also had public hearings. Uh, lots of articles in the newspapers. We had uh, votes in the uh, uh, Board of Education about uh, about this project. Uh, we then, after all these meetings, we got the approvals that the town requires us to get. Uh, all the permits, we have our building permit, we have the permit to build and do everything this project's needed that the town required us to have. Uh, once we had that done, we began work on the project. Uh, shortly after beginning work, uh, a tree warden showed up. And the tree warden who I believe gets uh, his authority from the uh, state, from Hartford, not local. Uh, uh, although he works for local, it's kind of weird. He works for the town, but he gets his, uh, his power from the state. Uh, he showed up. Now, along the process, uh, no one's uh, in planning and zoning or uh, DPW or any of the other uh, town agencies that we worked with ever mentioned uh, that we needed uh, to have a discussion with the tree guy, uh, tree warden. Actually, we 
we, uh, uh, with the architecture review group, we went over the different landscaping changes, the trees we were going to plant, the trees we had to remove. Uh, and uh, uh, we clearly went over that. We had our uh, engineers, our landscape design guys meet with the architecture review. They changed things, moved things around, and we accommodated the needs of the uh, town of Greenwich. Uh, this gentleman showed up after all the approvals were made. We started work and told us that we have to, we cannot remove a certain number of trees. Uh, now those trees, now I love trees. Most people love trees. There's not a lot of people who dislike trees. I'm a big fan of trees. So uh, don't get me wrong in that sense. But, uh, but basically, let me try to make it clear about the trees that uh, we, uh, we're required to take down, but he's told us we can't. And I'll break them up into make it very simple. It's kind of complicated, but I'll make it simple. Leading down to Cardinal Stadium, there's a road. That road needs access uh, by fire trucks, by emergency vehicles, and it's re we're required by the uh, uh, by the town, by the fire department, by the fire chief uh, to make this road 20 feet across. In making it 20 feet across, we only have 20 feet. We have the state property, we have the board of ed property. The 20 feet leading down to Cardinal Stadium, right off of Route 1, there are two, and they are beautiful sycamore trees. There's a pair of them. They're beautiful, and but unfortunately we have to remove those sycamore trees, those two beautiful sycamore trees, in order for us to be compliant with the regulations uh, for the town, uh, for, the, uh, for the fire department, for emergency vehicles. We have no other alternative. The tree, uh, uh, the tree guy told us we cannot remove those trees. We cannot have safe coverage of Cardinal Stadium for the fire, for police, for emergency vehicles, according to other uh, regulations. So he's told us we have to leave these trees. We can build our beautiful stadium. Uh, we can uh, build it. We can have the press boxes, the bathrooms, the team rooms, all the latest features the whole town of Greenwich has been hoping for for some time. We can have all of that, but we can't use it because we cannot make sure the thousands of people that are in Cardinal Stadium are safe. So therefore, we cannot open Cardinal Stadium. We can build it, but we cannot open it because the tree guy, tree warden, has told us we have to, we cannot remove those trees. Second, we have the ADA parking issue. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have mapped out a place where uh, the ADA parking is meant to be. It's about 17 spots. Uh, we're required by federal law to have 17 parking spots for the amount of seat capacity within Cardinal Stadium, the new bleachers we're putting up. So we've made allotment for that. Uh, unfortunately, well, within construction, that the as we pave the parking area, there's now going to be overflow of water, non-permeable surface, which creates drainage issues. So after many studies, boreholes, uh, uh, the engineers, uh, the town uh, DPW, uh, many people have figured out how we could deal with this drainage issue. And we've got the approval from the town with the drainage issue. Now, we create a uh, rain garden to collect this water. Now, there's a certain sort of underneath rock formations that exist in that area, and there's only certain areas that can accommodate the, uh, the rain flow from the non-permeable uh, surface. So therefore, there's an area where there's some trees, and those trees have to be removed. Uh, the tree warden told us we cannot remove those trees. This was explained at great expense. Our, our, our engineers and our, uh, our architect met with the tree warden three separate times. We met with a whole staff of people, with the uh, landscape design people, with the engineers for the drainage, uh, with the architect himself. It cost us, those three meetings cost approximately $10,000 in adjustments of taxpayer money in order to convince the tree warden that these trees had to be removed. We, he simply did this. He looked at the area, saw there was another area where there was no trees behind that not caring that there was rock formations underneath it, not caring that the, the soil could not absorb the water from the uh, parking lot. And he said, well, why can't you put it over there? We explained to him multiple times why we cannot put it over there. He just said, well, that's too bad. You're going to have to put it over there. So the tree warden has told us we cannot we take down those seven trees within the, uh, the uh, drainage area. So this being said, we do believe we have federal jurisdiction uh, over this by uh, ADA uh, regulations that the federal government, we've contacted the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, who could advocate for us to be able to make or take down these trees, superseding the authority uh, of the uh, state tree warden. Uh, also, we too believe as well those two trees that create a hazardous issue uh, with emergency vehicles and fire vehicles, we think we do have the right to take those trees down. So we think our appeal 
that we're going to make is is when we the, the board of ed is going to have to vote on that. So we might, Mr. Bernstein, we're going to have a or have that call for an emergency, hopefully a Zoom meeting to a vote on this. But we have 10 days after the uh, uh, the ruling was made by the tree warden. That uh, that ruling was made four days ago, so we have six more days. We have a meeting with uh, uh, the town of Greenwich Planning and Zoning. Katie DeLuca set up a meeting quickly for Monday morning to address this issue. She was unaware of it. Uh, we made her aware of it today. Uh, so basically, we're going to make an appeal. Uh, I feel very confident we're going to win that appeal. Uh, but according to Tom Hagney, our land use attorney, uh, he says uh, he anticipates in his experience uh, with appeals over the tree warden could take as much as a year. So basically, the Cardinal Stadium will be built. It'll be beautiful. There'll be uh, uh, team rooms. Uh, there'll be bathrooms. All the things we wanted in Cardinal Stadium, the entire town of Greenwich wanted that. Now, because of nine trees, uh, we can't do that. And plus, also, I, I must say this, this last bit about the trees. In our architectural, in our landscaping plan, we are planting many trees, beautiful trees. We're planting really, really nice trees. Now, understand, the sycamores, they'll be very, very hard to replace. The other ones that they're making reference to, they're not as beautiful as those two sycamores. Breaks my heart to take down those two sycamores, but unfortunately, the health and well-being and safety of the people in Cardinal Stadium is more important to me than a couple of beautiful sycamores. Uh, ADA parking, uh, the people, the uh, uh, pe disabled people being able to come to a game with dignity, not being driven in a golf cart for everyone to watch as they scoot by, having to wait far away from the stadium with a golf cart, golf cart to pick them up. There are situations where in the past, as, as a coach uh, of a team, uh, where parents uh, wanted or have their grandparents or disabled people come to a game, they would call me an hour or two in advance where I would actually literally carry with the help of others, these disabled people into the stands an hour before to save their dignity and put them up in the stands. They'd watch their, their grandson or child play in a game and they'd wait till the stadium clears out. And we'd all go back and I'd go back with whoever helped them in the seat in the first place. We'd take them down and try to do it with, with as much dignity as possible. Here we have a stadium with ramps, elevators. We have uh, ADA parking. We have all that stuff available that we've been dying to have for a long time. Who hasn't had a uh, a, a mother, sister, somebody say something about the porto potties, how horrible and disgusting they are, uh, and that we need this new stadium. So the tree warden has put on the brakes for this project for what looks like a year. We're going to fight. I've suggested, but I think it's probably uh, me being too aggressive that we ignore the tree warden. Uh, but I'm being told by, uh, by sensible people that uh, I probably shouldn't do that. Uh, and people have also contacted me and said, hey, Joe, you mind if I show up in the middle of the night with a chainsaw? And I said, you know what? Please don't. And you know what? I'm, I'm serious. If anyone has an idea out there, don't do that because these trees are tall. And if somebody gets hurt doing something like that because we want a stadium, I don't want to have that on my conscience. So please do not in the dark of night chop down these trees. But we have to do something as a community and not, not sit, sit by and take this. Uh, I'm going to end with that, but I'm going to come back to a second issue. That was passionate. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Joe. Joe, did you have another report? Mr. Kelly, did you have another report? Yes. Oh. Am I up? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that was quick. Thank you. Um, the, we, we, as talked about in one of the previous meetings, uh, the community has come together, Hillside community and others. Uh, have decided that it's it's time to beautify the waterfall at the corner of Hillside and Route 1. Uh, that, that is a beautiful feature. It's way over, overgrown. Ashley Cole has volunteered to spearhead this committee. I told her I would serve on it as well. Any other board member that wants to partake in that, that, that committee uh, is more than welcome. The uh, committee uh, will, the action of beautifying the waterfalls on that corner will be funded by, uh, by public money, uh, by private money, not public money. Money will be raised for this. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm behind this. And uh, uh, Superintendent Jones, Dr. Jones, will be giving you a list of the members of that committee. And we'll talk about how we're going to form that and what we need to do moving forward. All right. Thank you. Any other uh, board committees, liaisons? Karen. Ms. Hirsch. Thank you. Um, I wanted to give an update on SEAC. Um, so SEAC held their first annual meeting last night. Uh, during the meeting, they received an SEAC is a special education um, advisory committee. Um, they held their first annual meeting last night. And during that meeting, they received an update on the ESSER grants. Um, they reviewed and approved the draft of their year-end report. 
which I will bring up uh, again when we get to the agenda planning later this evening, is uh, we'd like to make sure we can uh, have that presented to the board and the, and the public. Um, and they went over member terms and held an election for the new executive committee and officers. With that in mind, I would really like to thank Caroline Learham, SEAC's outgoing chair, for her dedication, advocacy, and focus this year. She's done an outstanding job to help shape SEAC. I'd also like to welcome Dawn Zimmerman, the new chair of SEAC. I know she will continue to help SEAC move forward. I'd also like to thank the departing members of SEAC and the other outgoing members of the Executive Committee, Vice Chair Jennifer Katai, Recording Secretary Robin Baldwin, and the Corresponding Secretary Katie Bistron. Thank you all for your service and your invaluable input this year. Your hard work and commitment has truly helped create a strong foundation with which SEAC can continue to build upon in the years to come. And uh, I know that uh, we will have a lot to work on uh, next year. So uh, I want to thank uh, all of the continuing uh, and incoming members, uh, some of which who have not been selected yet, for, for all their dedication and advocacy uh, for the special education community. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, if we could set up the computer. Megan, if you give us one second, we'll, uh, we'll get you set up. All right, Megan, let's give this a shot. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Bernstein. Um, two, two quick reports. One, one of them, them. I get a lot of feedback, hopefully not. Okay. okay. Uh, the Distinguished, Distinguished Teachers, Teachers Awards, Awards Committee had a, I mean, the Distinguished, Distinguished Teachers, Teachers Awards were done remotely. Thank you to Kathy Bernetti. Um, it was a really beautiful remote ceremony. And both um, last year and this year's teachers and educators were recognized, um, which was, which went without, went off without a hitch and was, um, was really a great thing to, to be a part of. Um, secondly, I just want to share um, some highlights from the Greenwich Alliance, who continue, Greenwich Alliance for Education, who continue to do amazing things for our schools. A um, couple of, uh, couple of points uh tuning to uh, tuning into music which they just we just finished their they finished their first year and um there's a recital video in the works nearly 70 students received free instrumental music lessons uh which is which is really amazing um what's being in the process right now are the reaching out grants for the 2021 2022 they were voted on by the alliance board who met on tuesday $108,445 will be awarded to six grants. Uh, of those grants, those six grants include the Western Middle School Unbound Innovations, New Lebanon Theater Arts, Havemeyer Families as Partners, Eastern Middle School Ruler, GHS Esports, and the Greenwich High School Education and Wellness Center. So um, amazing things are happening in our schools. Thank you to the Greenwich Alliance um, helping, helping fund these, um, help, helping to fund this. Uh, also, the new Greenwich Alliance's newest initiative is called Avid Success, has many events planned over the next six weeks. So board members and the community are welcome to attend. This is Monday, market calendars, Monday, May 24th, the mentor training, and Thursday, June 3rd, student sponsorship coffee. Um, so please reach out directly to me or to Julie Ferenias uh, if, you have, if you need any more details. Great. Thank you, Megan. All right, with that, we're gonna move on to our discussion items. The first item is summer school, Dr. Carabillo. And you need to unmute. You'd think that after all this time, I would remember to unmute before I speak, but I don't. So good evening, Chairman Bernstein, Board of Ed members and attendees. The Greenwich Public Summer School Program begins on July 6th and will end on August 6th, 2021. Pre-K through eight students who qualified for literacy numeracy extended summer learning have been identified. Invitations will be sent to their families tomorrow morning. Pre-K-8 students who qualified for ESY and related services have been identified and the pupil services staff have notified families are in, and are in the process of determining which families choose to have their children attend. The pre-K through five elementary students will attend Glenville Elementary School this summer. 
regular education invited students will attend from 9 to 11, and the EY, EYS students will attend from 9 to 11 for their LEA and 11 to 1 for the related services. And that depends on their IEPs. All invited middle school students will attend Central Middle School. They will attend from 8 to 11. ESY students will attend until one o'clock for the related and specialized services. All middle school acceleration math courses and secondary acceleration credit recovery advancement attainment will also be held at Central Middle School from eight to 11. Some courses that have labs will be longer. The registration opens tomorrow morning. Some courses will be offered in person and some will be remote. All math acceleration and math courses, science, English for English language students, level one and two, and computer arts will be held in person at Central Middle School. The remainder of the courses will be remote. The, um, let's see, what else was, uh, I just lost my notes. There are some new courses added to the course selection this year for secondary, computer art, introduction to computer programming, A or B, the art experience and health and wellness. We are looking forward to having the website open tomorrow morning and secondary students may go in and register for their courses. Please look for the GPS summer learning program on our website under GPS summer learning. <laughs> Any questions? If I have this right, basically, uh, still like last summer, focus the numeracy for K to five. Correct. Uh, and then credit and recovery is still for uh, for the high school as well as some advancement courses. Is that right? That is correct. Six eight also has been invited for their literacy and numeracy continuation. We need some additional time during the summer. Okay, and can I ask how you're going to track the um, how you're going to track the success of these students that are coming in for the literacy and numeracy? We are using Lexia and then the scores on that they receive in September to see what the growth has been from June to September on their linked assessments that we track, the benchmarks that we give our students. Thank you. All right, any questions, Ms. Downey? Um, I just have a question about when you said some um, of the, I think it was only the secondary are gonna be in person and some are gonna be remote. Could you give an example? Yeah. And you kind of went through it rather quickly. So to just kind of all of understand the why we're doing is, things remote. Sure. Uh, we're offering the remote courses because we feel that it gives uh, students and teachers choice as to how they would like to take their courses. The algebra and the science courses have to, we, from our experience last year, we really realized that those two areas, two content areas have to be in person. Some of our courses for math are really very um, intricate and in watching them online last year, I visited all of the classrooms. It was really imperative that students have that face-to-face -face experience. For the other courses, for American history, for civics, for English, those courses were able to have more opportunities to work in small groups and to do some work independently and then come back to, together as a group. So that's how we made those types of decisions as to which courses should be offered remotely and which courses should be in person. If there is a student who is supposed to be in person, but they really want to have it uh, remotely, we will make arrangements. All right, Mr. I say thank you. Mr. Sure. And how many, how many people did you invite? We had over 900 students that were invited that qualified. Can, can you send us separate? Can you send us separately a uh, breakout by uh, grade and school? Um, I will check with Jen Lau. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we've gotten summer school reports before, so we get an understanding of where the kids are and where the program is going to be located. And it gives us an idea of uh, how effective it'll be based on prior performance. 
So yep, if you could, that'll, uh, that'll be in the report in um, if, if you could follow up on that, that would be helpful. Yep. I, I would um, you can send it to us through uh, Dr. Jones. Mm -hmm. I would though note the summer school report we usually get is in the fall. So, but it, it could no, I, be I, I understand that, but you know, in this circumstance, we've got a changing program. So I'd like to understand. It I'll send you a copy of what's on the website. I'd like to understand sure. who we invited and, and what we're um, planning. So if you could just follow that up, that would be great. Ms. Walsh. Ms. Walsh. Um, I think this question may be more in, in line for Dr. Jones, but um, given Ms. Carabello's comments that this was a majority of this was going to be in person um, and we could try to accommodate for those that are going to be remote, are we officially at the end of this year terminating our remote school and, and then summer school will take place as normal? Is that how we're proceeding going forward? No, not necessarily. Right now we have a survey out to our parents, uh, K-5 especially, because um, we are still just, I think we're just under 400 students right now and surveying whether or not the parents um, are looking to return full, a full return. Um, within that age group, um, they've encouraged all of us to kind of stay nimble. And so we're still processing that right now because if they don't, if there's no vaccination in K-5, the requirements from the Connecticut Department of Health may be different for K-5 than they are 6-12. Um, so we're, we're working through that. But right now the numbers are looking, at least in the survey, fairly low of the ones that may still feel like they're immune compromised or have other situations where they would need remote. So it's definitely, I don't think, going to be what it was this year. So do we feel comfortable based upon how we intend to run the summer school program that we can accommodate all the needs from those students that are appearing in person and those that may elect to appear remote? Yeah, and I think I might let Ms. Uh, Dr. Carabello answer that, but I think we're, we're willing to be very flexible with those families that are still requiring that right now. Dr. Yeah. Carabello? Yes, that is yes, that is yes. Yes, that yes, is yes. We are being very flexible. I don't know why I'm echoing like that. But yes, we are going to be very flexible for families and students. Mm -hmm. Was I think it's definitely yes. Sorry, and back to uh, being flexible. I'm sorry. So we are going to be flexible for families and uh, make sure that we meet their needs as best we can. Um, so I, I appreciate that you've made some slight improvements in the, uh, the timing for classes uh, from last summer, um, but I still just wanna make sure, you know, I, you know, I know you were talking about uh, looking at the growth that students will show uh, in the fall. Um, but I do wanna make sure that, you know, in the past, prior to COVID, our summer school uh, had four hours at least per day per course. Uh, and the school was at least five weeks long. Summer school program was five weeks long. Um, and I know that we're, we're still short of that. Um, it's slightly better than last summer, which was two and a half hours per day for some of these courses. Do you feel that uh, we'll be able to get through, if, they, if you're looking at an accelerated course, uh, the proper amount of time for that curriculum uh, for students to be able to access the material, to be able to move forward for the next year if, if, if they meet their uh, benchmarks? There will be certain courses that will be four hours long. We have to take the lead from those teachers as to what is required. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to ask, I know we were talking about extended school year options. Um, and uh, I know that, you know, you have that from nine to 11 and then related services again from 11 to one. Um, and I want to make sure that again, that, you know, within our special education community that we feel that that's enough time to be able to address um, some of the issues. I know that uh, a lot of those services were uh, shortened last summer for obvious reasons. Um, but will those students also be able to, they'll be attending in person if need be or remotely yes, if that is what they choose? they'll be attending in person unless the parents uh, feel that they want them to be remote. They'll attend the um, literacy and numeracy in the morning 
with their peers and then uh, have their specialized instruction and or uh, their related services from 11 to 1. They also will have lunch and uh, be able to have a break between because kids need a break. Okay, so I guess that the timing might need to be adjusted because you said a nine to eleven and eleven to one. But my oh, I'm last sorry. final question: I the registration school, begins tomorrow. School, like, um, hours and then elementary hours. hours. But you know, who have not necessarily been invited as well. Uh, and when is the information going to be going out to parents? Uh, I know oftentimes they need to take the time to look through the catalog to make that decision. For the elementary and middle school um, invited students. And I think if you turn down your speaker a little bit. That should alleviate the problem. For the middle school and elementary students who have been invited, they are the only students and the ESY students who will attend summer school. Secondary students, math acceleration for middle school students and secondary students will be able to register for whatever courses they need. And when is that information being sent out if you're looking for acceleration? Tomorrow morning, to it will, the website will be open for all secondary students to register. Parents pre-K eight for the invited students will have an invitation tomorrow morning with the information on the invitation so that they can register their students. Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Downey. I just forgot I had one other question. I think at one point we discussed that there was gonna be summer school in neighborhood schools, Dr. Caraballo, or was a decision, I mean, I just remember there was discussion about that or it, it, the decision is now that everyone's gonna be at Glenville. Everyone who does not, who has been invited to two sites, Western Middle School or Jillian Curtis Elementary School, those two administrators have invited specific students to attend their summer program. It is not connected to our Greenwich Public Schools summer school program. The students who were not invited by the Western administration and the Julian Curtis um, program administrator have been invited to our Greenwich Public Schools summer school if they qualify for the um, additional learning time. And that's gonna confuse everybody. So that basically what you're saying, the 900 you're inviting is in addition to who was invited at Western and at Julian Curtis? Correct. Is that, is that correct? Correct. I think, you know, to follow up to Mr. Schur's question, I think we'd like that in data of information of the number of students. Number of students on, who qualified. Well, to get it, because I, it's a fuller picture of. Right who's going to be use, utilizing the services. Yep. Did you hear that, Ann? Yes, the number of students that were identified and invited across the, uh, the K-8, pre-K-8. Okay, Hi, Mr. Chair. Uh, I thought I was following along, but obviously I wasn't. Um, now I'm thoroughly confused about this program. I, I knew that you would be confused with that. Do you have an ESY program? Yes, an we do. Extended school year program. It's mandated by yes, the federal government. Yes, we do. Um, we have to provide that to students Correct. who are identified for extended school year as part of their, as codified in their individual uh, education plans, their IEPs. That is correct. I understand That's that. Sure. The, uh, the I the extended school year services and yeah. for those students in which schools. They will, will be at, Gren be at Glenville and at Central Middle School. Glenville and Central Middle School. Central Middle School. Yep. Okay. Um, then we have a set of students who um, have been invited by Greenwich Public Schools, the school district, to attend uh, summer school, particularly for needs of, of – uh, remediation 
not for acceleration, for remediation. Well, These are kids we who consider it, we consider um, it acceleration because they haven't been able to achieve their student time. growth during the year for whatever reason. And correct, Anne? They need additional learning time. So we really right. frame it as acceleration. We want to accelerate their uh, skills. But they're selected, they're selected on a series of criteria that says that is, in their particular grade, that is they're correct. essentially below their growth projection, correct? It's a combination of things, yes. Okay, so now you've changed how we do that. I think I need, Anne, now an understanding of the selection criteria. Was that in the report on summer school yes, that you provided is. already? So you already told us what the new selection criteria are? It's been the same. It's the same uh, criteria that we've used in the past. Okay, fine. Then I don't need anything new. Okay. Um, and then, of course, you have classes you'll be delivering at the high school. No, the or from or from the high school will correct? be secondary classes will be offered at Central Middle School because we cannot have students at the high school this summer because of the uh, soil remediation. That is correct. Okay, so those courses will be there. What is this uh, Western Middle School and Julian Curtis admin selected? What is what, what the is two, that? The Title I schools came to Dr. Jones, Mr. D'Amico, and I and asked if they could run their own program. They wanted to see if they could um, get their children in front of their teachers for a period of time during the summer. Using so what money? We, so Dr. Jones and Mr. D'Amico and I said, let's give it a try. Let's see what happens. Using what money? We are using ESSER funds. When, so I'm sorry, did I miss it? Was this disclosed to the board before today? Not to my understanding. So let me just be clear. We're using funds that have been given to the, uh, am, I, am I hearing this correctly? This the administration is made a decision to spend money on put a particular new program that is not a part of one of our existing programs. Yes, it is uh, one of the qualifying yeah. uses of the ESSER II funds. But it never came to the board. Uh, it is, I believe it is in the ESSER application, which I believe did come to you. I'm going to have to go back and look at that meeting. So now we've got, now we've got a program. I'm, I'm not saying it's good or it's bad, but now we've got an educational inequity, don't we? Yeah, we have an educational inequity. A certain schools have certain programs that other, other students don't have. The students who were chosen for Western and for Jillian Curtis are the same students that have been qualified to attend the Greenwich Public Schools summer program. The administrators wanted to see if it would make a difference to have them in their own schools with their own teachers and wanted to see if that would be a better program moving forward than the larger Greenwich Public Schools program that okay. sometimes I, students I, get their teachers and sometimes they don't. So, so now I'm hearing it's a pilot. That's, that's a definition of a pilot. I don't have a problem with a pilot, but there are very clear rules in our policy on how pilots are managed. I'm just, we're supposed to be governing the school system. And I'm not saying this is a bad idea at all. I can, I'm, I'm all ready for the attack on, oh, so-and-so said this was, you know, is attacking these students. No, this is a situation, unless somebody can show me otherwise, and I'll gladly be wrong, where this program was not properly brought to the board for its review and governance. And it's, it's money. Dr. John, I'll move on. Yeah, if I if I just might clarify, 
these are students who qualify for summer school. The request of the principals was simply for them to have summer school in their own schools with their own teachers. And all of our Title I schools looked at doing that this summer, um, especially coming out of COVID. They feel like if their children can have their teachers that are actually in their buildings and they're in their home schools, that they're going to be perhaps more comfortable and they may see more growth. Mm -hmm. It is still part of our summer school program. It's not like we're running something that is a pilot that is totally different. It's about connecting kids and mm -hmm. children with their teachers. And we, the board, we don't ever bring approval to the school sites to the board. We actually plan that according to what schools are open, according to all of the capital projects that are going on across the district, how much space we have in any one building and how many students actually qualify that we actually need to place in the buildings. All right, Ms. Hirsch. Oh, Ms. Hirsch. So just as a quick follow-up then, you know, I, I know last summer we did everything differently. So we're going to just put that to the side in the years prior for summer school, how many different sites were summer school courses offered at? Well, we actually, though, let me just clarify even with that, because last summer, even though we were in COVID, we had a new model for summer school that we discussed with the board, which was literacy and numeracy. And it used to be like an all day program where there was art and all kinds of things that were offered. And we changed it to be very targeted on literacy and numeracy. And it depends on how many students, but, um, and it'll be interesting to see this year, how many actually sign up just because we invited more doesn't mean we'll necessarily, you know, get more students, but it, it depends on how many actually decide to come. Yeah, I, I know that prior board members, one who's actually sitting in our audience at the moment, um, have had long-term discussions in regards to re reinvigorating our summer school and how courses are being offered to be able to give them per, uh, only there for part of the day. So that's to, so I appreciate that that was something that was being looked at, but last summer, a lot of uh, courses were offered remotely for obvious reasons. So that's why I was saying, not including last summer. In years prior, how many different sites were offered it for summer school programming? I know at least elementary, middle, and high school, but were there multiple sites? We had elementary sites. We had three elementary sites. We had a preschool site, and we had uh, it was generally um, uh, Cost Cobb, and then one other elementary school. Then we had the high school program, which was the secondary program, which is where the high school students went and some of the middle school acceleration courses were there. Middle school students generally went to the high school. So if we had a significant portion of students that were invited and they all decided to come and then other students wanted to come for acceleration, we would have to open additional sites to, to support the needs anyway. Is that correct? I, I might answer that too. Sorry, that is correct. And I will say just this summer planning for our sites alone was was very, very challenging. So we'll be watching it right up until when we enroll because losing the entire high school site is a, that's a big site for us. And it also hosts um, the park and rec programs. So now we're having to share central with park and rec as well as summer school. So it'll be very much um, driven by the enrollment, whether or not we're gonna have to go and have another site. And we've already discussed, for instance, having to move pre-K out of Glenville because that could be at least four classrooms uh, into just an, another pre-K site by itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the last question is, you know, I know in, su in some summers past, especially for students who were, uh, invited or required to come for whatever the reasons we've all, have we ever, it was transportation. Do we, you know, is there funding if, if transportation is needed or do we feel that it would require less funding if it's for certain schools to be in their neighborhood schools that they can walk to? We do offer transportation for summer school and they are um, pub stops unless a student who receives ESY services has specialized transportation. Sorry, and that was a little garbled at the beginning, if you could uh, repeat. We do offer hub stop transportation for summer school. And we have specialized transportation for ASY students if it is on their, um, if it's one of their related services and they have to have specialized transportation. Thank you. All right, I guess we will. Ms. Walsky. So just to make sure I understand, the way it, this will work this summer is that those 
uh, students that are that currently are at Western and Julian Curtis that apply that are eligible for summer school. They are the only students that will have the opportunity to go to their same schools for the extended summer program. Um, sorry. Sorry. Um, so in Glenville and Central. Yeah, if their teachers sign up. And that and that's the thing. All, um, we looked at the other Title I principals were hopeful that maybe they would have it. They just didn't have the staff to work in the summer. And if we were going to have them with different teachers anyway, then we went ahead and went to the central site like at Glenville if they're going to have a teacher from another building. So then how do the other students from the other, you know, because you know, there's 11 elementary schools, and how do they get dispersed throughout the schools then? What, what is the criteria? Well, I think Anne was referencing the um, criteria to qualify, and then they go to Glenville. Or, or right now, they had planned to have fourth and fifth also at Central. It's going to all depend on numbers, because Central is also housing the Park and Rec program as well this summer. All right, so we'll look forward, and to getting the follow-up from you. Mr. Uh, Bernstein? Yes, Mr. Chair. I, I just... I just want to say this for the record. Um, we have just actually created an educational equity issue. We are telling students, if you don't go to Julian Curtis, Julian Curtis, by what the superintendent says, they get a program where they get teachers that they know and it's delivered in their neighborhood. Western, they get teachers that they know and it's delivered in their neighborhood. Students at Central and Eastern don't get that. And all the other elementary schools don't get that. I mean, I, I, I'm just repeating what I'm hearing from the administration. And it, it, it bothers me a lot that, um, well, I don't know who else is concerned about the educational equity associate. Well, our job as a board, we're required to deliver educational equity. If we wanted to deliver a program for students, to have their teachers that they know teaching them in their neighborhood, that would have been fine. Somebody should have brought that forward. I, I would have supported it. I, I, I think we are spending not enough time on this board dealing with programs that we know that work, that, achieve, that close the achievement gap. We know there are kids who need to catch up. We know that, that's a, that's a national phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon under COVID. Yet here we are, I don't know, six weeks before this program is supposed to start, finding out that this is what we've done. I, I don't know how, I, I don't know how to stand well, in front. The, I don't, I don't what's, know. What's the, I'm trying to understand what the inequity is that you're concerned about. When you're saying we're creating an inequity, we're providing an opportunity for tell all your, of our tell, No, I'm just trying to understand. I, I, I'll explain it to you, I'll explain it to you. Here's the inequity, okay? They obviously thought there was some educational merit by what the superintendent said to say, uh, Julian Curtis and Western think that they can do a better job, fill in the blank, do a better job educationally for those students by having teachers that they know in their building, teaching them locally in their building. We're, so we've we, now done that. We're now going to do that in two schools, but the rest of them, sorry, you got to get on a bus and go across town. But it was discussed with us, which is why I brought it up, that it was going to be in multiple schools, that it was proposed. And we, we and that's why I asked the question. But, I, but we also can't force the teachers to work so at, at a particular school. So I'm just asking the question, would you rather just not allow them to do that and have everybody go centralized? I'm, I, you know, no, I would have rather, if this was a, a discussion we were going to have, that the administration on their own would have red flagged that they were, uh-oh, that's a good idea, but we may be creating this issue. Therefore, we need to think this through. And clearly that didn't happen. I guess I'll just add my two cents as we close this out. Um, I don't think we want to be opening all 11 elementary schools over the summer. In fact, a lot of schools have uh, work that goes on during the summer. One will be completely offline this summer. 
Um, as Ms. Downey said, we can't force teachers to work. We get the teachers that come to us. I, I heard Dr. Jones say the other Title I schools looked at it and they couldn't get staffing in order to, to do this. So I'm not sure we would get that across the district. Uh, quite honestly, with, with 900 kids identified across the district and the capacity at Glenville somewhere in the mid fours, uh, we may be seeing an additional site, need for an additional site. I, I think parents are probably going to be looking for things for their kids uh, to do. And, uh, and with, the, uh, with the issues that we've had in the past year and a half, thanks to COVID, uh, we may get a uh, tremendous up, up, uh, uptake of the, uh, of the students. So I, I don't know. I think I'll, I'll look forward to the report in the fall and, uh, and hear more about this. With that, I think we'll move on to our next item, which is uh, the regulation around facilities. So Dr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Bernstein. Um, this is really just uh, for information only because regulations don't generally come to the Board of Education, but I felt like this one was important because it is part of the OCR um, resolution that we are working on. So this um, is one of the first steps where we must have a regulation that actually helps families understand what the process is if the building is not accessible for their child, uh, or even if we have a parent who feels like that building is going to impede access to their child's classroom. Uh, this lets them know what the process is. Uh, Abby Wadler with the Town of Greenwich um, Legal is working on this and will do our submission to OCR. Uh, but this regulation also goes, um, goes along with um, floor maps of the buildings where OCR wants to see where an elevator is in a building that's being recommended. Um, it also uh, goes along with some um, evidence that we have put more signage up around our schools. Right now it's temporary signage and though we will have a sign on those doors that are not accessible that lets people know which door in the building and how to get to the accessible entrance. For instance, instance at um, Old Greenwich, the only accessible door is actually um, kind of in the alcove area where the dumpster area is that's level. And so um, the other doors at Old Greenwich will be posted at how they would actually go to that door uh, to gain access. And again, this regulation goes with policy 35510, uh, which is about facilities. And then the regulation you'll see has the R. It'll be on the website um, right underneath policy 3510. But the submission is due uh, first week in June. So I just wanted the board to be aware. Any discussion? Ms. Hirsch. Um, thank you for providing this to us. I just had one quick question. Um, once you uh, vet this through legal, et cetera, and it's given to OCR, where will this regulation be posted just uh, so that parents will be able to know where to access it should they need it going forward, um, you know, if it's in handbooks or, or on our website in, in uh, our, our board policies, et cetera? Um, all of our uh, policies and regulations are on our website uh, under the Board of Ed tab, and you'll have the policy is um, posted 3510, and then right underneath that, any regulation that goes with policy 35.3510 um, will have the R behind it that lets people know it's a regulation. So they'll all be right there together. Thank you. I'm sure uh, that will help others be able to find it. Ms. Kowalski. I, I just had... Mm. A uh, question regarding um, busing. When, when a student m is moved to a different school because of the ADA compliance, having not met, uh, but being met in their uh, neighborhood school, how does busing work for that particular student? We would actually, uh, we would supply the busing. Okay. And then the other question I have is, um, does this also, so for example, with respect to families, let's say they have a child that has um a need to move to an ADA compliant school, but they also have a sibling do, and they don't want to separate their siblings. Does that fall within this as well, where we would move both siblings to the other school? Yes, we would allow the, the family to attend one school. All right, thank you very much. The next item is the strategic plan update. So Mr. Sher, you're up. Um, hi, everybody. Last time we met, um, our committee had submitted a, a draft survey uh, to be sent. Um, we asked for feedback. Uh, we got feedback very quickly from uh, Ms. Downey. Thank you, Christina, very much. Um, a few weeks later, we got some feedback from PTAC from Brian, through Brian Peldunas. 
and then last week uh, got feedback from uh, Mr. Bernstein. Um, a lot of things were things that were said previously, so there weren't any particularly new items. Uh, just by way of reminder, because we haven't talked about this for a month, the survey essentially covers five uh, topics. Uh, one is uh, asking parents if they have any input or attitude about the current strategy of the school district. Item number two was uh, about educational equity and how much of a focus that should be. That was at the request of Superintendent Jones. Then we asked questions about the mission and direction of the school system. Um, that was uh, largely a function of our work earlier in the year or almost a year ago now uh, about mission, which we adopted, but uh, rightfully we should check with the community about that. And then the uh, other item was about uh, focus of the system, what we should really be prioritizing in the delivery of a Greenwich education. And the last question was about uh, perceptions of strengths and weaknesses of the system. Uh, just by way of reminder, the last time we uh, did a strategic plan survey, uh, we asked questions about mission and direction. We asked questions about focus and we asked questions about strengths and weaknesses. As a matter of fact, most of the questions that are in the survey uh, about like particularly strength and weaknesses and uh, focus and direction were pulled from the survey that was prepared by um, public consulting group uh, when they did that engagement with us. Uh, we didn't think on the committee that it would be a good idea if the questions were already used, already used with students, I'm sorry, already used with parents, uh, written by a professional consulting firm at great expense to the board, that we would be smart enough as lay people uh, Karen, Karen, and Peter, uh, sure, to uh, rewrite those. And fortunately, we had a check on that with um, uh, professional uh, uh, survey people. Um, in terms of feedback, uh, they can probably be put in categories. A well, uh, question about survey length, uh, comments about grammar of the uh, survey, um, there was a discussion about definitions of two things. Uh, one is uh, the definition of personalized learning and the other one was on educational equity. Um, I'll come back and address that. Other subjects were in the feedback, uh, particularly the PTA thought, are you gonna ask questions about communications with parents? And they also thought there should be some operational questions. They're not strategic in nature, but they're operational. Concerns like transitions uh, between elementary school and middle school and other things like that. And then the last uh, point was kind of order of questions. So by way of update, and then I'll address each of these, uh, in your email box is a link. Uh, we took the survey. Fortunately, we had the input from uh, Ms. Downey uh, when we were trying to do it. We took that into account and we programmed the whole survey. So when you go into your emails, uh, when you get home, you can see the survey. It's all programmed in SurveyMonkey. Um, it's set up uh, per their rules. Um, a lot of things that were, um, th some of the things we adjusted so that when you program it, it works a little better. So it would be helpful if all board members would go back and take a look at that. Now that you can see it, you can actually run the survey. It's in test mode. Um, and uh, give us uh, feedback. We've incorporated the feedback that we got. It also will particularly help with looking at survey length. According to SurveyMonkey, uh, the response rate uh, will be in the mid to high 80s. They score that for you. I don't know what uh, artificial intelligence they use. And uh, we thought the survey length was 20 minutes in length. They're saying it'll only be 15 minutes in length. Okay. Um, I, I'm not smart enough to question what SurveyMonkey uh, is doing by the, the use of that tool. Uh, we adjusted it to remain to say the survey will take uh, 15 to 20 minutes. I'm gonna still stick with 20 minutes. Um, but I would appreciate it if board members would go look at that draft survey. Now you can see it, you can see the table, so on and so forth. 
Um, and we've adjusted kind of now that it's programmed for proper uh, survey uh, standards, like the Likert score, the, Li the Likert uh, scoring, you can have a, a Likert with five attributes or seven attributes. We standardized on five now that we've seen how to program it, et cetera. You can see that we've corrected the grammar. Um, in terms of definitions, just a reminder, personalized learning definition is from the published strategy documents that are published on our Board of Ed website. Um, there may be other versions of it floating around, but they're not approved by the board, so we're not gonna use them. And then in terms of educational equity, uh, I think as uh, um, Ms. Kowalski said at the last meeting, um, in the state of Connecticut, there are five different definitions. So we don't really know which one to pick. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear uh, by the questions, we're trying to get to the answer. We're not asking someone to validate the, uh, a definition of educational equity. We've asked some very specific questions. So go look at that. Um, in terms of other subjects, particularly for Brian Pelbdunas and his team on the PTAC, very important question about uh, that they think should be asked about how well the district communicates and engages with parents. Yes, that's an exceptionally important question. Um, in our committee, just as a way of reminder, I think I said this last time, but maybe I didn't communicate effectively enough. Uh, communication is being handled in the panorama survey by the superintendent and their staff. It's a critical question. Um, and as I said last time, we're not gonna ask in the strategic plan uh, survey every question that could be asked about the district. It'll just make the survey longer and it will make the survey not focused on what we need for the strategy process. Um, in terms of the orders of the questions, fortunately, SurveyMonkey automatically um, takes questions. And if it has more than one option, it automatically randomizes that. That's a standard best practice in surveying. So regardless of what you see in this document, the paper document, uh, when each of you takes the test survey, you'll notice that uh, you won't all be looking at the same questions, not the same questions, the same items in a question uh, in the same order. Um, we, we try to randomize that. So the survey is there. Uh, as I say, it's available to the PTAC. So Brian, if you could circulate that, look at that now that it's programmed, uh, come back to us with any uh, adjustments you need. The same uh, with board members and anyone else in the community who's interested in giving input to our community, uh, our committee rather, about the survey, just uh, send us an email. You can send it to board. Um, I'll, I'll watch uh, what we get. And if there's a question about the link, I'll be sure and send you a copy of the link and you're welcome to give us feedback. We only want a survey that is useful. Uh, so with that, that is the current status. Discussion? Sounds good. Ms. Downey. Um, thanks, Peter. And thank you for giving me a little gold star sort of thing. Um, anyway, um, I just want to find out like the committee after our last meeting, like, did you guys discuss the survey and come up with a game plan vis-a-vis -vis timing or, you know, kind of what, what was the thinking of the group, you know, based on the feedback and where we're going to go with it from here? We have not met. Uh, we were waiting to see what kind of feedback we got uh, other than what was said and your note. Uh, we didn't get a lot. Um, uh, then the PTAC came in. Uh, so with everything that else was going on the board, kind of took that in, made adjustments in the program. I think what we're looking for now is for people to see it live in living color and to take that input. And then I'm going to schedule another meeting of our committee based upon uh, what comes back. Um, because this is, we're only advisory to the board, this thing runs at the rate and pace that the board meets. So uh, it's um, slow. Right, but just, it, just to get a sense of what we're thinking in terms of when it would go out, because now we've kind of, you know, obviously you have to do it right. It, doing it fast and wrong isn't the right answer. So it vis a be the panorama survey, you know, back to survey fatigue to people, if there was any thought it's process. A, it's a, it, uh, 
it, the governor at this point is how frequently this, the Board of Education meets. Because if you'll recall, uh, we had talked about being on a schedule to get in the field and, uh, and have the committee really drive that on behalf of the board. But um, as we've been reminded in recent meetings, we're only advisory to the board. So it's gonna run at the rate and pace that the board um, takes it up and uh, schedules it. I, I, I don't know the calendar. Maybe someone can remind me when is the next time the full board meets? June 3rd. June 3rd. So this won't get taken up again until June 3rd, unless the board uh, wants to give us instructions otherwise uh, offline. Um, you know, now you're in summer and what have you, and you know, it's now running. It's the, as they, as they say in project planning, the critical path item, the, the limiter is the meeting schedule of the board. So that's where we are. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for building it. It'll be a lot easier to, uh, to see and feel and touch and give you more feedback, but uh, you know, the feedback I sent you by email was the same as the feedback I shared at the meeting. So you, you've got it. Ms. Hirsch. Oh, uh, just as an update, um, since we haven't had a chance to meet or discuss, um, I did just get information uh, at the very end of last week from Dr. Jones um, as to the sample questions that are going to be used for the panorama survey. And um, I responded uh, with some questions and comments and I, uh, you know, was waiting for that uh, to be able to give it to our committee. Uh, so uh, to just to address the questions on communications to families, uh, they are specifically and well covered in the sample questions already uh, provided through the panorama survey. All right, I guess we're going to move on. So our last discussion item is actually the uh, superintendent evaluation. Give me one moment. Uh, so the board met with Dr. Jones last week in executive session for the purpose of conducting an evaluation of her efforts for the 2020-2021 school year. Dr. Jones continues to evidence professionalism with her calm, cool, and collected demeanor, even in the face of adversity. And the 2020-2021 school year certainly presented its share of challenges. Throughout all, you have been focused on the students. Any discussion around this year must start with the response to COVID and the return to school. The lessons of last spring and summer school certainly guided Dr. Jones and the district in developing a plan and ensuring regular communication with the board and the community throughout the process. You took our feedback and criticism from, from last year on wanting live learning and better remote learning and responded. You kept us informed as the state guidance regularly shifted. You held multiple forums with the parents to allay fears and explain options. You were accessible, you listened, and you were responsive to our needs. That we were able to begin the year with full in-person options for elementary and middle school and a hybrid model for the high school, while also running a parallel remote school is a testament to the work of Dr. Jones and her entire team, as well as the teachers and staff. Through your leadership, you achieved what others couldn't. The reopening work done in Greenwich has been the envy and model for other districts in the state and country, the community, the parents, especially the working parents and the students, thank you. Your positive attitude and diligence meant that every problem was addressed and that you were willing to lead the staff to a place where we could best serve students. Beyond the academics, you have supported the social emotional learning aspect for students at a time when that is needed most. I know that you were looking forward to getting back into the schools to interact with students and out into the community more at the start of the next school year. Even with that going on, you've continued to move forward by setting goals for yourself based on the priorities for the district, including the selection of a new K-8 math book, the rollout of the Linkit tool, and the new parent portal. You've championed the independent external review of the special education program and remain committed to driving recommendations forward so that we may, we may better serve our students and their families. This will very clearly be a goal for 2021, 2022. We asked last year for better communications and transparency and you have provided more detail to the board and community. You should continue to ensure that all questions are answered and that the district follows up on board requests in a timely manner. You've made difficult choices and changes and shouldn't be afraid to make further changes as needed. However, now that you've had two years in the district and have put a structure in place through your hiring and staffing decisions, you must really start to delegate more. This will provide you the opportunity to focus on more strategic issues and ensure that staff is executing. 
As we discussed, please continue full speed ahead with the ongoing curriculum work to make sure that it is visible to parents, implemented consistently across the district, and that teachers have appropriate tools to use. We discussed a renewed focus to drive achievement, especially developing an action plan to close the achievement gap. We also covered the need for continued discussions around the AOP program. You showed grace during the budget season and did not get flustered by the number of questions posed by the board or the other town bodies. You and your team were lauded for providing detailed written responses and for forging strong relationships with other town departments. On capital projects, you and the team continue to drive forward with ensuring that processes are followed as you close out prior year projects. It was pointed out that you never leave a meeting with the state and EPA on remediation at the Western Middle School without ensuring that the next meeting is scheduled so to keep that process moving. The RTM was interested in more information on capital projects and you and your team responded by creating a quarterly report in addition to the information you already provide to the board monthly. Overall, you have helped create a culture by having a plan and then implementing that plan. You stand your ground when needed and you always keep moving forward. Your work ethic is off the charts and you are self-motivated. You clearly set the tone for those around you. We thank you for your continued strong leadership and the stability that you have brought to the district. And with that, we're going to move on to our action items. Uh, the first action item is the AP European uh, History textbook. Uh, is there a motion on that item? Sure. Ms. Stowe, all right, moves to accept the uh, recommended AP European History textbook, a second. Ms. Hirsch, discussion, Dr. Carabillo. You're gonna to have to unmute and Aaron's gonna to have to capture you. One would think I would learn. Uh, We're very happy to present this textbook to you. I do have a copy of it in my office. Should you like to come and peruse it? It really is a fabulous textbook and I love the way that it's organized. And I think that you will too. The comments from the students really show that it is a book that is going to really keep them engaged and give them multiple opportunities to be as well prepared as possible for their um, future endeavors in college and beyond. So I hope that you will consider approving this text. All right, discussion? Seeing no discussion, we will actually move into a vote. So the uh, motion is to approve the recommended AP, US, uh, AP European History textbook. Uh, so the roll call, uh, Bernstein is a yes. Stowe? Yes. Hirsch? Yes. Downey? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Kowalski? Yes. Olson? Yes. And Cher? Yes. Oh, Peter stepped out. All right, well, that vote is 7-0. All right, thank you very much. The next item is the GHS vestibule architect approval. So Mr. Walk, if you wanna come down and while you're doing that, Ms. Downey, I believe you have a motion for us. Yes, um, having served on both the feasibility committee and on now on the building committee, I'd like to make a, we'd like to make a motion to approve Silver, Petrocelli and Associates as the architects for the GHS entryway project. I don't know if we're going in vestibule or entryway. So. <laughs> thank you, I'll second that. Mr. Walco. Uh, good evening, um, Superintendent, Mr. Chairman, Board of Education members. Um, I'll be brief. We, uh, we've been meeting with the building committee for a couple months now, a little bump in the road with respect to architects and the selection. Uh, we went out to bid the initial time um, and received only one submission that was qualified. We had to go out again um, and we received four qualified uh, architect uh, submissions. Um, and they ranged quite frankly in cost and in scope. We ended up interviewing all four. We then um, took out the uh, one architect that just didn't seemingly meet our needs. And we ended up with uh, three that were sort of in contention and then ranked. We ended up selecting Silver Petroselli, which is the architect that the feasibility, st uh, feasibility group had also selected. Mm -hmm. Um, we were comfortable with all of the three that we ranked. And, um, and so with that submission, uh, we certainly can hit the ground running once uh, uh, the vote takes place here today. Um, I will say from a, from a sort of trying to always improve the process, 
I think the Board of Ed should really look into the process between feasibility study group and then building committee group. Um, if you if the building committee becomes effectively a, uh, a continuation of many of the feasibility group individuals and you're interviewing those same architects, unless that architect has stumbled tremendously in the feasibility study, um, the sense is that they have a leg up. They know the project, they have drawings. And um, I'm not gonna say that it creates an unfair advantage, but certainly in the mindset of many of the committee members, I think it's just natural to assume if you voted for this particular architect previously, you're going to vote for that architect again. Um, and so I just think someone should look at that uh, because quite frankly, it's a process that takes time, take energy, not only from the Board of Ed Purchasing Department, but from building committees. And, um, and it's something that we might wanna to try to improve upon. I don't necessarily have any answers for you tonight, but that's something that um, maybe should be discussed. So with that, uh, I would recommend to you uh, the Silver Petroselli. They uh, also, you should note that they were the lowest bidder. Um, on this about $2.7 million project. Mr. Chair. Um, was it unanimous to pick them? It was not. Um, yeah, the I vote, I mean, the ultimate vote was unanimous. The ultimate vote was unanimous. The rankings were not. Um, I think there's a couple of architects on the committee. One. Oh, there's only one. Okay. How did he vote? Uh, I believe, well, again, the it was unanimous vote to vote for them. Mm -hmm. The ranking, I believe he, in fact, picked this one as one. Number one. Okay. At one being the highest. The highest. So the ranking was one for yeah. your highest. So it's the lowest vote getter. Okay. And just that it was seven of nine of us had them as first choice. Okay. Okay. So it, yeah, I can't remember who were the two who didn't. But it doesn't really matter. I'm... I'm <laughs> I'm more interested in the people who are no offense to anybody on that committee. The people are kind of the experts in the room and who do that. I right, was so during, interested in their view. So, but I got it. Thank you. Fair enough. But just, just so you know, the, the part of the process was we had asked that one member to develop the list of questions to ask the architects to that very point of relying on him more than anyone else who's lay people. And we had people who are non-voting members who had input as well from the building department and Steve, I know you said you had no answers, but I find it quite interesting or no suggestions for improvement. But I find it quite interesting. Uh, the feasibility studies architect having an advantage, having worked on the project, how to separate him or her from the opportunity to get the uh, final job. Uh, you can't deny them the opportunity to participate. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's an interesting suggestion and it makes a lot of sense when they do have an advantage. Um, but uh, I have to th certainly think it through. It's certainly thought provoking. Is there any anything you thought of that might be a solution to that? No, part of, part of the issue is that the charter requires not only the building committee to recommend the architect, but then the board of ed to select the architect. So you have a system where maybe, maybe the delay is naturally built in and maybe it's good to have that check and balance. Um, but there's also the sense that if you're an architect bidding for it and you know an architect has already been on the site and developing the feasibility group's input, it's, it, it's just harder. Hi, Steve, you might remember me. We were on the building committee for New Lebanon together. And I would like to remind you that we did not select the architect that worked on the feasibility committee. They did submit, but we actually chose a very different firm, which had a very different proposal. So I, I hear your point on, on the process stuff, but in that instance, we clearly went in a different direction. So, you know, I guess it, it works both ways, right? They get the knowledge, but it doesn't mean they're always going to, to get the win. For sure. But, but here, I, I, I I think Silver Petrocello did a nice job on the feasibility. Uh, clearly, your committee made a uh, you know made a decision, and uh, I see no reason why we wouldn't support that. So, and just so you know, just to give you an update, because I don't I really get to come before you in terms of updates on these projects. The goal really is to to obviously not build a very safe, secure entranceway, also to define the front entrance of the building, which really doesn't have a front entrance, but it's also to do it in a time frame where we're not impacting the school year. So we're really trying to pay attention to, do we front end this and try to impact a, a spring semester where you're getting out, or is it going to impact the fall semester when kids are coming back, especially being the front entrance? 
So we're, we're trying to, we're, we know we're not going to be able to complete a project in one summer. Um, so it's going to impact a school year. We'll, we'll let you know and, and let the school know how that's going to impact it. All right, thank you. Just for uh, the board before we vote on this, the next step is the committee is gonna go off with the architect if we approve it. Uh, they will work on a design. They will have to come back to the board per the charter with the design and we have an opportunity to to, uh, to vote on that design. And at that point, I'm, I'm presuming you'll update us as to the schedule, anticipated scheduling. Correct. Which would include all of the town processes and procedures and there's no trees in the front of the high school for uh, this project. That is correct. All right. All right, the motion on the table is to approve Silver Petroselli as the architect for the Greenwich High School entryway project, uh, taking a roll call vote. Bernstein is a yes, Stowe? Yes. Hirsch? Yes. Downey? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Kowalski? Yes. Olson? Yes. Cher? Yes. Eight zero. Thank you very much to the uh, committee. Uh, congratulations on getting an architect, and we look forward to having you back soon. Great, thanks. All right, then the next item is to set the 2021-2022 superintendent salary and consider, consider a contract extension. I think we're gonna take this separately. I recognize Ms. Stowe. Yeah, so I'd like to make them separate motions. So the first motion is to approve a 2% salary increase for the superintendent of schools for the period July 1, 2021 to June 30, 2022 from $236,640 to $241,372.80. Is there a second for that? Ms. Hirsch, discussion. Ms. Sure. Um, I mean, I think this is a, a no-brainer. Frankly, Tony took a zero last year. 2% uh, to me seems more than reasonable. It's in the budget. It's what the rest of the cabinet is getting. I believe it's in line with the town employees. And um, like I said, I think, I think you should get at least this. So thank you. Yes. The BET met on Monday night. They voted a 2% increase for the town management employees. Other discussion? All right. Hearing none. Um, okay. So uh, the vote is to increase the superintendent salary uh, for the next year by two next school year by 2%. Bernstein is a yes. Stowe. Yes. Hirsch. Yes. Downey. Yes. Kelly. Yes. Kowalski. Yes. Olson. Yes. And Cher. Yes. Okay, that passes 8-0. I'll turn it back to you, Ms. Stone. I have a, I just want to interject for, for just a brief moment, but I have, I am not quite sure of the language of the motion, and if it was in the paperwork, I apologize for not having it in front of me, but I have a, a couple of things that I'd like to uh, address, and I don't know from a well, we, we need the motion on the table, the on so the unless table. it's around the salary, we'll take the motion first and then we'll get to discussion. Ms. I'd, Stowe. I'd like to move to amend the contract between the Board of Education and Superintendent Dr. Tony Jones to extend the term through June 30, 2024 and authorize the board chairperson to execute the amendment to the contract. I'll go ahead and second that motion, Ms. Stowe, for discussion. Yeah, let me just give you a little background here. Under the provisions of paragraph 3B of the contract prior to the end of the second year of the three-year agreement, the year that we're currently in, the board shall vote for a new agreement. Dr. Jones requested we extend her contract for an additional two years, making it again a three-year agreement. On May 13th, the board met in executive session to discuss the superintendent's contract as allowed under the Connecticut Freedom of Information Law. No votes were taken in an executive session. The current contract with the superintendent currently runs through June 30, 2022. Thus, this would be a two-year extension to the contract and have it run through June 30, 2024. By law, superintendent's contracts can only run for three years, and three years seems to be market. A two-year extension would show our support for Dr. Jones, provide stability, and recognize the positive contribution that Tony has had on the district since starting in July 2019. I won't repeat all that Peter said in the evaluation earlier, but I have to say that I was very lucky to lead the search for Dr. Jones a couple of years ago, and she has by far exceeded my expectations. She's a thoughtful, strong leader who aims to somehow please all the different stakeholders, and that's not easy. 
She's made some organizational changes, which have reduced the overhead and put more money and focus back in the classroom, which I appreciate. She's accomplished so much and kept moving our school system forward while doing what many other districts are still struggling to accomplish, opening their doors during COVID. I cannot discuss this point enough, since it's important that we don't forget how many could not open for many reasons, but Dr. Jones listened to the community, worked tirelessly with our team and us last summer, and I know in speaking to parents and kids how appreciative we all are. It's impossible to predict how someone will handle a pandemic, but Dr. Jones' work ethic, calmness, and strength came through. As part of her request for an extension, Tony has said that she's enjoying her work in the Greenwich Public Schools and is looking forward to many more years to come. I'm also looking forward to many more years with Tony as our superintendent. Thank you. Further discussion, Ms. Kowalski, did you wanna speak? Um, sure, so I have in, in general really three points and I've raised these with all of the fellow board members um, in, in separate discussions, but I do think there are a couple of things that, that need to be addressed. Obviously, we, um, I agree with some of the sentiments that were expressed by uh, Mr. Bernstein and Ms. Stowe about uh, Dr. Jones. And I also have um, some criticisms of, of Dr. Jones and she knows them and we've had conversations about them. Um, I think that moving at the speed that we are, and we do still do ha as a board have time under uh, Dr. Jones's current contract, but I do think that it makes prudent sense uh, for the board to send out an anonymous survey. Um, otherwise, I would call it a 360 review for those in the, in the business world would, have it, would call it. Uh, to the administrators, staff, and, and parents, because we've heard from parents this evening from both sides uh, to give us a clear uh, approval and, and disapproval of Dr. Jones, but I think it would be prudent to have that review of Dr. Jones as her role uh, as a superintendent prior to this board making a decision to make sure that we have all of the information available to us that it, that we can grab before um, I think we make a, you know, a decision of this nature. It is one of the most important decisions that this board makes. And I think that there is, uh, it would behoove us to understand um, her as a leader and how what her administrators and staff think um, and, and well as the community as a whole. Further discussion? All right, uh, on the motion. Well, she doesn't have a motion, she's just coming. All right, well, the, this there's... is discussion on the motion. So if there's discussion on the motion, this is the time, yep. folks. Yeah, fair enough. I, if I there's, know, if I, discussion? yeah, right. I have further points that I'd like okay. to make. Go um, ahead. I also think, and we've, we've talked about this before, that, um, you know, with respect to the renewal or extension of Dr. Jones is in contract. Um, I think that there's one provision in there that is um, noticeably absent from her contract. I know we've talked about and how it seems that these are cookie cutter contracts as it relates to uh, superintendents in the state of Connecticut, but it is not a cookie cutter contract as it relates from a national perspective. Um, when we look at other contracts, and those are the one thing that's glaringly missing from this um, is a, um, a reciprocal clause for both of us to have the right to terminate uh, the contract without cause. You know, Dr. Jones is uh, able to, under Section B8, to, to terminate and, and to walk away. Um, and we as a board and as a community don't have that ability to do that. We only have the ability under a, uh, a mutual release, but that means that we have to have a mutual understanding that that needs to, uh, that the relationship needs to end. And here we end up in a situation where, you know, if one of us doesn't think that um, the relationship is working, that's fine. But when both of us don't, you know, when one of us disagrees, we don't have that option. And I think we're putting ourselves as a board and as a community as a disadvantage to not have something uh, as simple as a, a reciprocal right in that contract. 
The other piece that I would raise here is I understand the desire to, by the my fellow board members, to uh, extend Dr. Jones's contract by uh, two years to extend it to June 30th of 2024. Look, my proposal on this and I, what I could get comfortable with is something shorter than that um, for various reasons. One of which is that three, maybe four of the board members uh, will not be sitting here in November. And as I mentioned, it's one of the most important decisions we make as a board that uh, we should see what the election holds and what that new board coming in thinks and how they would like to move forward as that is a clear representation of the community's views by having the newly elected board members present and making the important decisions. With that, I would suggest that perhaps the extension should not only be, should not be two years, um, but should be, you know, at most one year in which it would be extended to June 30th, 2023, whereas the newly seated board in November could take up this issue and decide whether or not to extend uh, Dr. Jones' contract even further at that point, giving um, basically giving credence to the fact that the community has spoken and there'll be potentially four new board members that should be added to that decision as opposed to strapping the, that newly seated board with a superintendent that maybe a majority of them don't like. Going back to my other point of why a reciprocal provision in the contract would make more sense. And I think we're doing ourselves as a board a complete and utter disadvantage by not making some very simple uh, changes in the contract. Discussion, Mr. Chair. I think you had your hand up first. Okay. Um, I'm not really saying much about this uh, because I'm leaving the board and I feel strongly and I've told my colleagues this, um, when you have this level of board turnover already known in advance, because board members have publicly declared what they're doing, at least three of us have publicly declared what we're doing. Um, I don't think I should have this kind of voice in this decision. Um, I mean, I could, I could talk about all the reasons why it might be a good idea to keep Dr. Jones an extender contract. I could talk about all the reasons why um, I think otherwise. It's not important. What is important is I agree with uh, what Ms. Kowalski um, has shared with board members previously uh, that um, it's not a good idea for an outgoing board to tie the hands of the incoming board and the motion that uh, Ms. Stos put on the table um, ties the hands of the board, not only this board, it also ties the hands of the next board in the next election, which will be out in 2023. So we're not only tying the hands of one board that's incoming, we're tying the hands of two boards uh, in, in the future by uh, this proposal. Um, given that's going to be maybe half the board turned over. I don't think this is it. I thought there was a compromise to be had and the compromise to be had was either or both um, to signals of the community. We didn't want turnover in the superintendent's office, but at the same time, preserve the rights of the board that are going to be incoming and the public to express that through a public vote, which they will have an opportunity to do uh, in November. Um, it would have meant a shorter extension than the maximum that can be given. Ms. Stowe's proposal is to give the maximum that can be given under uh, current contract law in, in Connecticut. Um, I would have supported extending the superintendent's contract for an additional year, which would mean two years from now, uh, so that everybody could get their feet wet and decide what they want to do. I also thought, and I liked the idea when, I, I, I'm amazed we're writing contracts that we don't have, the residents of Greenwich don't have reciprocal rights um, and the contract is one-sided. 
I've spoken about this before. The response uh, given by other board members has been, well, that's what's in the contract in Darien and New Canaan. Shocker. The attorney who wrote this contract for the Greenwich board is also the attorney for those two towns who wrote those contracts as well. So that to me is not a good rationale. I think it's just prudent that a board makes certain and whatever the termination clause is, as an example, the termination clause, I think right now is the, the um, superintendent can notify us in 120 days. Okay. Make it so we can do it in 120 days. If that gets changed to 180 days, great. 180 days. And then our clause is 180 days. I don't care what the number is. What I care about is, is that we have as a community, the flexibility to have a reciprocal right to what the superintendent would have um, in a contract that we write uh, so that we can make uh, the decisions that the community may need to make and the community is not disadvantaged in doing that. I don't want the superintendent disadvantaged either. It just seems to me it should be um, equal. And then to the last point is, I'm very uncomfortable voting one way or the other on this contract um, because I've served this community for a really long time. And um, I've learned that as much as I think I do know, there's frequently stuff I don't know. So I'm not arrogant enough. I'm not self-assured enough. I'm not Napoleon complex enough that I can sit here and say that I have any idea right now what the staff thinks about their leader, which I think is an important input. I'd really like to know that. They may think their leader is the greatest thing since sliced bread and they want me to go out there and get the longest contract possible. Okay, I'd really like to have that piece of information. I don't know where the public is on the superintendent. I've heard, I've been serving for a long time. And right now, uh, half my mail, not even half, a lot of my mail is some unhappy people. And there's a lot of it. And my telephone rings a lot, much to my wife's chagrin. She wants me to stop talking about the Board of Ed and spend more time on my company because uh, she has to listen to it at home. But then I also see emails that are very supportive of what has happened with the superintendent. So I'm sitting here candidly. I, I don't have the information I need to make this decision. And I've been through this a couple times and usually it's one way or the other. Uh, this time it's not. So I thought the idea that Ms. Uh, Kowalski had to get a 360, by the way, that's standard practice for executives in the real world, not in this weirdo school world, uh, seemed pretty reasonable to me, but I don't know. The, the, my fellow board members will have to decide whether or not they, um, from the limited information they have, they can make the decision. Uh, I can't. Ms. Downey. I think it's, there's a bit of irony as we talk about how much we hear from the community and then saying we don't have enough information to make a decision. I think we hear from the community repeatedly. We all know in our inboxes on any given issue. So to say we don't know how people feel about the superintendent, I, it's a little disingenuous to me. The fact of the matter is this town doesn't have unanimity on anything. So I think to say we're going to survey people to get an answer isn't going to yield an answer any more than the voluminous emails that we already get. So I respectfully say I don't think that's a, a, a productive use of time. I think also we as elected officials that is our job. Our job is to make the decisions based on the information we've gathered over an extensive period of time. Um, in terms of this board making a decision about the superintendent's contract, this board, half the board turns over every other year. To say that we shouldn't make a decision because it ties the hand of future boards, again, is not fulfilling our role or our job that we were elected to do. And, and frankly, half this board is new and we could have said, well, gee, you shouldn't have hired Dr. Jones. And where would we all be sitting now um, based on that same analysis? 
Um, and we do have a termination clause. We don't have a termination for no reason clause. So I am satisfied that, you know, should there be an issue with Dr. Jones, which I do not anticipate happening, um, we would be able to avail ourselves of that opportunity. But I, I think going back and renegotiating, and it's not a minor point, it would be a fundamental point to our contract, um, is not appropriate um, at this moment in time. So I respectfully disagree with the points that have been made thus far, and I wholly support the motion. Ms. Hirsch. Um, I personally fully support extending Dr. Jones' contract. Uh, not only would this help provide consistency and stability for Greenwich Public Schools, which is something that the community has consistently asked the board to do, uh, but with the countless articles discussing early retirement resignations and resignations of superintendents across the country this past year, including recent articles from Education Week and the New York Times amongst uh, many local papers all throughout the country from the biggest uh, districts like New York City, LA, uh, all, all the way across the 50 states. Um, I think it speaks volumes about Dr. Jones' dedications to our students, staff, and the community of Greenwich that she's asked to extend her contract. Um, as I said uh, before, uh, some, someone once said the true test of leadership is how well you function in a crisis. And I would agree. Unfortunately, this year, we've had several major crises, and Dr. Jones has handled each and every one professionally and with a measured sense of control. Last year, we commended her for her professionalism and responsiveness and for the hard work she has done, and we've done so again this year. Um, in a year like no other, with constantly moving targets, she's kept her eyes on the things that mattered most, our students, the needs of our students and our staff, emotionally, physically, and, so, uh, and educationally. She's taken constructive criticism and the feedback garnered from many parents and worked tirelessly to ensure that our schools could open their doors this fall improve, and improve the options for remote students. Um, that was greatly appreciated, not just by families in our district, but also commended by districts throughout Connecticut as a model. And um, I, I think one of the, the most important things uh, that makes a superintendent a good superintendent, and have, having only worked as a Board of Education member with one, I've had the opportunity to work with countless uh, supers and, and um, interim supers uh, over the past few years in, in other advocacy, educational advocacy roles. Um, being responsive to, to, cr to criticism and making the effort to make the changes uh, being asked of you is, is exceptionally important. And Dr. Jones has shown us her willingness to do that. Um, you know, I know we've, we've made some recommendations and uh, Mr. Bernstein shared those with you as to what we'd like to see going forward. And I'd like to be able to give you the time to make those, you know, to take the opportunity to make the changes that we've asked you to do and move our district forward as promised uh, as part of the goals that you set for yourself and the goals that we set for you the year prior and I, I'm sure we'll be in the goals that we probably will set for you going forward. Um, you've successfully navigated the challenging waters of budget uncertainty, and you've made sure that our educators and students have had what they've needed, when they've needed it. You've met every challenge and answered every question asked, and I know because I've asked a lot of them myself, and they're always answered. Um, you continue to provide our families with consistent flow of information. You've increased your communication with the community as well. And this year has provided you with many unique challenges. You've helped our educators navigate the ways to teach in-person and remote learners simultaneously. I hope we don't have to, uh, to, to figure out how to do that again. Um, you've created an entirely new remote school and filled them with teachers and substitutes uh, roles throughout our district amidst a teacher shortage. That's, that's pretty impressive. Either way, I think that you've really continued to be a tremendous asset to the Greenwich Public Schools, its students, the board, and our community especially with the extraordinary events and challenges you've been confronted with your time here thus far. Personally, I can say working with you has been an incredible experience. I'm sure it's a feeling that is are mirrored by many, and I'd like to thank you. And um, with that support, I, I really feel giving the opportunity to make the necessary changes and, and improvements for the education given to our students and the support of our staff through curriculum and, and professional development. I'd like to give you that time. Call the question. Um, still people that want to speak, Mr. Chair. Ms. Stowe. Just real fast. I've hired a lot of CEOs in my career. We've found a good one. We don't want to lose you. Uh, I 
do want to say a couple of things. One, the superintendent contract, yep, it's the same as Darianne and, uh, and New Canaan because it's the CAPS form. Yes, it was drafted by the attorney that happens to also do work for us, but it is the Connecticut Association of Superintendents of Schools that actually adopted that form. It's used across the state. In terms of the termination provision, uh, there's a couple of ways that it goes. One, mutual consent. If both parties decide things aren't working out, if things are that bad with the board and the superintendent, neither one of them wants to be here, okay? Uh, to the superintendent can give notice. We've actually had that happen twice in my recollection. Uh, and, uh, you know, we ex actually extended it from 90 days in a prior contract to 120 days for uh, Dr. Jones. Everything in a contract, by the way, is negotiable once the party decides they want out of it. And then third, for cause, as, as Ms. Downey said, we actually, if there were potential cause, we would work with the superintendent to rectify. If it can't be rectified, the superintendent goes. That's the protection you need. Superintendents have no tenure. They are not like teachers or administrators. The contract is basically the job security that they get. And it's tenuous at best in a lot of places, and this is one of them. So I can't imagine the message we would send to a community saying, Saying, well, we want to be able to get rid of you anytime we feel like getting rid of you, or we only want you for one year because the next group is going to toss you out on your ear. Uh, we have a statutory responsibility to select a superintendent of schools to run our district. I take that seriously as I do all of my other statutory responsibilities. Uh, as was mentioned, we turned over four members who inherited Dr. Jones. When I joined the board, eight years ago, got lots of experience in this now, uh, we inherited a superintendent. That's how this works, folks. We don't basically wait. We don't say to Dr. Jones, you know that there's an election in November. We're going to see what the outcome is. Let that group figure it out. That group who's never been on a board of ed, possibly. Some of them may, you know, the returning members might, but there'd be members who wouldn't. I don't know. I think we rely on the people that have experience with you. We've had two years of experience with you at this point. Uh, I would like to see more years of experience with you. Um, you know, the board picks the super. We've been elected by the community. That's our responsibility, just as it's our responsibility to ask for the budget that we need, our responsibility to carry out things like uh, student expulsion hearings. There's certain things we do. That is our job. Uh, I would like to continue to be able to do our job. And I think having you here enables us to do that. You have been responsive to the board needs. You are the first to admit when something isn't right, and you are the first to make the change to fix it. So I, I am uh, quite pleased to support to, to your extension. And with that, I am going to call the question. So Bernstein is a yes. Peter, Peter, let me speak yes. really quickly. Wait, wait, oh, wait. Yes. I'm sorry, Megan. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, yes. I'll be, I will be quite brief. Hold because... on one second. Hang on one second. Let Aaron get sure. you set up. Okay, go ahead. I will be quite brief because uh, honestly, all of my points have been, have been said. So um, to the, at the risk of sounding like a broken record or too repetitive, but I fully support the extension of Dr. Jones um, three-year contract. You know, as elected officials, it is our duty uh, and you've been consistent. She's been consistent. Um, she has had an impressive work ethic and she's filled the cabinet with some really fantastic new hires. And I really look forward to seeing the work that she continues to do. All right, thank you. With that, calling the question. So the question is to extend the superintendent's contract through 2024? Yes. Yes, June 30, right. 2024, yep. Yes, Bernstein is a yes, Stowe? Yes. Hirsch? Yes. Downey? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Kowalski? You get behind one year, but not two. No. So that's a no. Okay. Olson? Yes. And Cher? No. That passes 6 2. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Dr. Jones. All right. With that, we're going to move on to our next item on the agenda. If you all bear with me for a moment so I can bring it up. I'd like to make a motion to request the additional funding for the repairs of North Mianus and the alternate space related costs in the amount of $2,597,912. Is there a second? Sure. Ms. Stowe, thank you. All right, I think Mr. O'Keefe, you are gonna be our uh, chief explainer tonight. Good evening, everybody. Um, so as you know, we have already received a partial interim appropriation uh, for the North Miami ceiling collapse in the amount of $2,055,000. Um, and the rest of our initial request was deferred until we could get go out to bid, which we have just done and completed yesterday. So just as a recap for what the $2,055,000 includes, by the, way, by the way, can we get the chart loaded up? 
Mike, are you able to get that up? I could get it up, but the people in the building. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to see it in the room, but okay. the board members have it. The board That's members fine. have it. It's as you emailed it, and it's on board docs. Okay, I'll be as descriptive as possible. Okay, um, so just to recap on what the two million oh fifty five includes, it's one hundred eighty nine thousand seven thirty one of emergency response, remediation, and demo. Uh, and it also includes 627,143 for the demo of the first and second floor uh, areas requiring preventative work. Uh, it also includes 628,834 of uh, repairs for areas that were damaged. So the damaged areas from the collapse. Uh, and then there's an additional 358,097 for alternative space related cost. And most of that is uh, pre predominantly made up of transportation for about 307 out of that 358. We also applied, given the uncertainty, given the fact that it was, uh, there wasn't no a lot of knowledge, especially with regard to the, um, the rebuild for the preventative, we had applied a 20% uh, contingency, which was uh, relatively hefty. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we were awarded uh, 2,055,000. Since then, we went out to bid, and the process, as I mentioned, closed yesterday. Um, just as a little background, we had uh, a good number of uh, vendors that came in for the walkthrough uh, at North Mianus. And at that walkthrough, a number of them commented that they would probably not likely bid uh, given the uh, aggressive schedule. And they also cited, several of them cited the fact that uh, there was a lot of uncertainty in the uh, pipeline of materials and supplies, uh, you know, so world shortage of uh, things like gypsum and so on. Um, in the end, uh, when, we, when we closed at 10 o'clock yesterday, we only had one bid. And, uh, and that bid is reflected uh, on the uh, on the proposal in the yellow section. So uh, it's a total project cost of four million six hundred and fifty two thousand nine twelve. That's the total project cost. Um, the uh, once we subtract from that the amount that was already awarded, the two million oh fifty five. What we're asking for is exactly what Peter had. Uh, mentioned at the outset, 2,597,912. So when you look at the top of the chart, there are two uh, amounts uh, for the emergency response remediation and demo. That was already completed. Those two items for 189, 731 and 600, 181, those are already completed and those numbers are actuals. Then below that are the contents of the bid that was received yesterday. And you can see that there's a section called uh, base bid plus alternatives. Um, and the amount related to that in the bid was 1,411,284. And also um, there is, uh, we anticipate a number of change orders that either were not explicitly spelled out in the RFP or were identified uh, after the RFP was issued, those add up to another 334,000. Uh, we also have estimated the cost of a dedicated project manager for six months in the amount of 72,000. And again, given uncertainty in the world markets, we believe that a contingency of 15% is warranted. So that adds another 272,593. So that would get our construction cost, including the, the, the two items that are mentioned as completed already, would bring you to $2,879,789. Uh, then we get into the non-construction cost, what we classify as all alternative space related costs. Uh, the biggest one, uh, and it's not yet closed, we have not yet closed, is the facility rental. We estimate that uh, if we rent a facility from August to December, we estimate that it'll cost about $170,000 a month 
So that would amount to uh, 850,000. Um, we, we are working with a site and it's in legal review right now. So, but, so that number is a fairly good number. Uh, transportation, has, the number has been updated. We had 307,000 in the original uh, 2 million 055. Uh, we added another 300,000 for the, for the transportation from September through December. And then we have some other items, uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment totaling 68,702, security related equipment for 19,500, uh, a small amount for custodial overtime and other staffing for 22,000. Uh, moving expense, we already incurred uh, 65,000 for the first move. And we anticipate another move to get everybody to the new facility. And then there would be another, another move back uh, once, the, once the work is completed. So we've added in a total of 195. That includes the 65,000 that's already been incurred. Uh, storage container rentals uh, of about $10,000. So when you add all that up from the facility rental down to the storage container rental, it's a million. 773,123. Add that to the construction amount that I mentioned just earlier for 2,879,789. Gives us a total project cost of 4,652,912. And again, subtract from that funding already received of 2,055,000 uh, yields a additional request uh, of 2,597,000. $912. So Dan is on if you, if you have any technical questions or, or I'm here as well, if you have any questions re related to the numbers. All right, Mr. Kelly. Sean, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but if you could, for transparency purposes, uh, I hate change orders. Nothing annoys me more than uh, than having change orders early on in the project. Uh, I'm sure they're justified because we're doing everything as quickly as we can. Uh, but just for transparency's sake, could you explain, or if you have the information on those change orders for me, please? I, th I think I, Dan would be better equipped to address that. So, go, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear mm -hmm. you, Dan. So, Joe, would you mind repeating that question? I lost a little transmission there. Sean had mentioned in his presentation that there was a couple of early change orders that uh, uh, changed the, uh, the price of the, uh, the bid. Uh, just for transparency reasons, I, I, I just like to go over those change orders if you have that information. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you have that information, it'd be helpful. Thank you. Sure. That, that, it's not a problem. It's, it's you know, I, I wouldn't want to call them change orders just yet. Um, we have to come up with some kind of term for it. But these were items that were brought to our attention uh, post bid. And uh, whether they were whether they were brought up by our review of the documents or uh, brought up during the scope review with the apparent low bidder Werner Construction, uh, there was some significant um, lapses in, in the in the design documents, and that's probably due to how quickly we uh, had to put these documents together. Um, there's some items in there. I'll just put some big ticket items out there. Um, Painting. There was a, there was a specification for painting, but it was not clear as to the extent of the painting that was expected. Um, uh, pipe insulation that was not visible uh, during the uh, documents being put together. It was uh, hidden by the uh, hung ceiling. I'm actually going to put that uh, request in with the insurance company, but we wanted to get a price for it. So that's going to be part of the job. Um, um, uh, window treatments. Uh, we didn't realize how damaged the window treatments were. They were rolled up at the time of the water infiltration and water just sat in the shades. Uh, and we saw some visual evidence of mold growing. So we're replacing all the window shades. So those are just some of the items that we hit on as um, potential change orders, but they will enact, <clears throat> excuse me, they will in actuality become a change order. Thanks, Dan. That was very helpful. Mr. Chair. 
Um, Sean, I, I got a, and maybe Dan will answer it too. Um, I want to be sure I understand what I'm looking at. Um, the demo, the demo looks like it's coming in in line with what was estimated, right? Yeah, pretty close. Yeah. Okay. And then the 1.4 million is, um, based on the RFP that, that, uh, was written in the specification that was done by the architect engineer. That's correct. Okay. And then Dan just explained, there's some other items that, uh, needed to be added. Um, what's item number six HVAC new compressor. Can you elaborate on what that item is, Dan? Sure. The, uh, we know that we did a, a, an HVAC upgrade there uh, about 30 months ago. I think it was, well, less than that. About two years ago, it was completed. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. The, um, we had some damage to some of the HVAC lines coming back from the unit ventilators that are underneath the windows. Right. Uh, we had that. to contact. Excuse me. You said that in a prior meeting. Correct. So what we've what we've seen is um, the controls of the new units, because of the way the building is laid out, you've got some uh, classrooms on the south side and some classrooms on the north side of the building, mm -hmm. and we are unable to control uh, the temperatures the way the uh, this way the system was installed. By making this change now, we'll be able to, uh, during a shoulder month, say in April, when one side of the building is in the sun and it's calling for air conditioning, the other side of the building is still in the shade or in the dark calling mm -hmm. for heat. Our current mm -hmm. situation, we're not allowed to do that. It, the, okay. the, the, the system doesn't allow for it. By making so it's these an up, changes. It's an, up, it's an upgrade and a good upgrade, right? Yeah. It, it, correct. Yeah. Okay. And then the... Um, so the demo one, four, three, one, seven, two. So the total construction costs includes the demo. Correct. Okay. And then the, this alternate space facilities, where is this location? Uh, Tony, you want to address that? Yes, because we're in um, contract negotiations right now between our legal team and theirs. We can't say where it is. We hope that it will come to fruition in the next few weeks and we'll be able to share more information. Okay. Is the space already equipped as a school? What I can say is it would be an excellent site um, for us to have as an alternative site. I don't know what that means. I, I don't need her to identify the site. I need to know if it's equipped as a school or there's going to be some other costs. It would be an excellent site. And this is the cost that we would need um, other than the items that you see here, uh, moving our classrooms. Yeah, I know I see FF and E, but it's only 68,000. And I'm, I'm just kind of surprised that if it's a site that's, I mean, the last time you were here, Tony, you were talking two times ago, you were talking about, sites in Commerce Park, and you said they had been equipped as uh, schools for somebody else, and you didn't know if they were available. But the important part was uh, it had already been outfitted as a school, so it was usable that way. I see here FF&E of 68,000. Um, this is going to be, what, how many classrooms? This is uh, 10, no. 13, I think, was your ask. We actually had this, this site is a little bit different. There are 20 different spaces okay. of X amount of square feet, and that we have it all calculated out. And it would literally be um, another move, just like we did when we went from North mm -hmm. Miami mm -hmm. to alternate sites. Mm -hmm. We would be moving from OG, Cost Cobb, and Parkway, right? Um, and moving into the new space. Yeah, I'm just trying to find out. I, I appreciate that. I was just trying to find out how solid these numbers are. So, so Dan, what? Do I, am I reading this properly? The original request was 8.1, but the new cost is 
That's correct. So we really only need 4.7 to do this. We didn't need 8.1. Correct. Okay. I suppose that's a good outcome. Well, um, it, it is a great outcome. And, and remember that when we called out the 8.1, we said that there was a lot of contingency and a very high level estimate for the preventative work. So we knew we knew it was going to come down. Yeah. And I think when the 8.1 was originally discussed, it was only for the uh, demo and then the rebuild. Um, alternate space, I always understood, would be a separate item. So this is even better if it's all included. Um, my question is to you, Dan. Um, now that we've got the whole thing pulled apart, I'm not going to ask you the same question I asked before. Um, I know everybody wants to get back as quickly as possible and what have you, but you know, the school community, I'm, I'm not so sure is completely processed that now they're only going to have one bite at this apple for the next 20 years. And I'm wondering, Dan, if there's anything that uh, should be added to this because we've got the whole thing pulled apart. I realize you tried to put it, you know, particularly when this was asked by in the RTM meetings, I'm sure that maybe Dr. Jones sent along my question that was asked by RTM members in district 12, by the way, full disclosure, this is my own neighborhood. This is my own neighborhood school. So, um, but you know, there were two schools of thought. One was spend whatever it takes, do it in 90 days. Don't do the alternate. Um, you know, that was somebody's question, and I think you guys fielded that appropriately. But the other questions that came out were, um, is there anything else in the rush to get it done that we should be doing because it's all pulled apart and it's the right thing to do? Is there anything that should be added here, Dan? Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't I mean, say I like no what you did on they... HVAC as an example. That's a great ad. Well, some of the things maybe you don't see, Peter, is that we did take into consideration some of the older infrastructure. There's some mm -hmm. pipes that are in the building that are circa 1925. We're replacing those. Anything that okay, we great. thought could uh, e even uh, add to the assets or protect the assets, we changed. So there's some um, there's a lot of wooden um, millwork that was damaged or mm -hmm. or whatever still usable but in pretty bad shape we're we're replacing all that um the window the lighting sills, did. i was getting to the lighting shot um <laughs> the window sills also wood He's so excited um, the uh, uh the window sills are also wood and are stained and and cracked uh, we're changing those out to a uh, a corian type of material um, okay. again, all the countertops in the classrooms, all the sinks, we certainly don't want to have another cost cob issue. So we're replacing, uh, all the sinks that are in the classroom. Um, as Sean stated, we're changing all the lighting. That is part of the incentive program that was, it just happened to be happening at the same time. Um, that would have been an item I would have said, let's change while we're in there. Um, I, there's really not, the, the building has got great bones. The, the bathrooms yeah. in the, um, that part of the building were renovated, I think within the last five or six years, we do have a separate project to replace the bathrooms in the kindergarten wing that was designed and ready to be put off for bid this summer. We put the brakes on that because we didn't know how that was going to dovetail with the rest of this project there might be an opportunity to do that at the same time. But right now I, I don't even want to explore that. We have, we have okay. the dollars, we have the design, but it's, it might be a little bit too much to handle. So 4.7 is enough. Yes. To get this done. Okay. Well, it seems like this process worked out in the end. I mean, um, and now have you guys already well, that, when did you open these bids and you got it and it was qual qualified bidder was yesterday? Have you guys already started preliminary contract negotiations? Yes. Okay. When, how long is that going to take? As soon as we I mean, get off the phone. That's always a hard question until you tell the lawyers to stop. 
Now, we've, all- we've been doing it at the same time. So uh, uh, town legal's already been reviewing, a, a, you know, turning the RFP into a contract. So, okay. So it'll, it'll, it'll be very town quick bodies approve this quickly. This, this approval thing won't be a critical path item. If they take time, it's going to be a problem, right? But if they right. go well, quickly, we be- which I understand they're lined up to do, the, the project will go forward, right? Right. The BET budget is one o'clock on Monday, the full <coughs> BET 630 on Monday. And, uh, and we've got to, we've got to determine when the uh, RTM committees and full RTM can uh, schedule this. So we're hoping Just to that point awesome. on the RTM, let, the let, moderator did send a note. Uh, we're going to submit materials tomorrow for the RTM and they will figure out the path forward. Yeah. I, I would just say, and I know you guys are not necessarily part of this, but let's not make other town bodies the boogeyman. It doesn't help get the project done. It just gets people really agitated. If the BET stepping forward, which it sounds like they're doing quickly. Thank you, BET. Uh, I see Mike Mason in the back. Thank you, Michael. And uh, hopefully uh, the moderator will move as quickly and expeditiously and, and we can just go get this project done and the kids back in the school. Thanks for all the hard work, guys. All right. So, Tony, Sean, Dan, uh, I'm hoping you can talk us through the timing. I see on the uh, on the breakout budget, you're expecting the facility rental to run through December, transportation through December. So can you talk to us about the timing? Do you want me to take that? Yeah, why don't you do it, Tony? Yeah, okay, sorry. Couldn't hear. Um, Yes, for the timing, we are looking um, that we could go into January, and that's um, what the company said when they actually did the walkthrough. Um, We are hoping by uh, late December what will what will be part of the challenge and we're just trying to be very transparent up front is once the construction is done we have a lot of approvals with this project that have to go through uh, town approvals and that can sometimes halt us a little bit uh, and go a little bit slower so we're being very realistic about that um, so it it is a big project and we will we are expecting to be um, if we have an alternate location it, it's definitely going to be through the fall semester um, and that's what, what the, the construction team has said. And I know that, uh, that Sean mentioned earlier, like issues with supplies. Oh. Um, can you talk about the timing of that? I mean, obviously, once the BET acts and the RTM acts and the contract gets signed, like how quickly are they going to be able to get supplies? Well, once they sign the contract, then they will be able to start their ordering and, and moving forward. That's why time is of the essence, because uh, we are told right now, and Dan could definitely speak to, you know, the supply issue, but uh, there's a supply and demand issue, and especially going into the summer where uh, there are so many projects and uh, they need to get stuff ordered so that they can get the work started. So every, and if you look at it this way, I mean, when you're you know, a month of alternate site is $170,000. If this is four weeks late, that's another $170,000 just for offsite plus the buses. Ms. Downey. Just a question. I mean, ultimately, might insurance cover the alternate space location? I mean, we, I've, we obviously don't know that right now, but it's certainly something we would try for. We, um, and Sean can speak to this. I know he's working so closely, um, you know, with risk management. We're putting everything forward that we can. um, And Megan Zaneski uh, handles that for the town and does a terrific job trying to maximize what we can get. Peter, I have a question. Ms. Kowalski. Sure. So I, I understand that there's information that can't be disclosed about the, um, the rental facility and I'm a little, I have some concerns just that the board doesn't know anything about this, right? We don't know where it is. We don't know the setup. We don't know um, the, the type of contract we're entering into. Is this a month to month? What happens? Are we only able to rent it for five months? What happens if we have an overage? Can we go, can we get it for the next month? Is the contract going to have to be at a minimum for a certain period of time? Um, I'm just, I, I'm a little leery that the board has no idea. Well, I'm not complaining about the price. I'm just, I'm complaining. I'm not complaining. I'm concerned that we don't know anything. And I mean anything about where this alternative facility is, uh, the conditions, it's 
the cost, the terms of the contract. And I think these are really important things that the board needs to know at some point to understand what we're spending a million dollars on. Um, I think right now, just just realize that from the contract language perspective, it all goes through the town of Greenwich Legal. So they're working between uh, our town of Greenwich Legal is working with um, the other uh, land attorney that handles and manages the site. Um, we do have okay. flexibility in the contract that is written in to extend, or if we were done a month early, there is flexibility that is written in there, but that's part of what you negotiate back and forth as well. Um, and it is, um, it is a site that is in a reasonable distance. That was a, another key component. We've heard from several parents um, that have had children traveling to Parkway and it's, it's quite a, a it's distance. Far for children to be on the bus. Um, so we've been very cognizant that it's, um, you know, it's close. Um, so I think I answered mo most of those, but it, it is right now there, it's going back and forth between legal, between both teams. So I'd make two observations. One, um, well, a question, which is when will we get to know more information? And two, is it, a, a better process and procedure for the board to go into an executive session to get more information on the contract itself. Yeah, I'm, I'm not one. It's not posted for tonight, so we certainly can do it, but I think we'll figure out that way or Dr. Jones can let us know as things progress on the legal side, but I'm not sure it qualifies for executive session. So let me, let me dive into that with the town attorney and just make sure. All right. Other discussion on the item. All right, so what will happen is once we vote, uh, Tony, Sean, Dan are gonna be working on some questions they received from the BET, most of which they've answered tonight for us, so they already know the answers. Uh, we're going to share that with the BET. They're having the budget committee meeting on Monday at one. Uh, BET meeting is six, Mike? 6.30 on Monday night. Uh, we will be sharing the interim request with the uh, town clerk and the RTM moderator tomorrow. And uh, as soon as we have information from them, we'll share that back with the board. Uh, but we, uh, we did give them as much notice as we could. The, uh, you know, I think everybody's in it together. And I know Dr. Jones mentioned the, all of the approvals that will be necessary on the back end. Uh, we do have a commitment from the first selectmen that uh, they will work expeditiously uh, to make sure that, uh, that they are in the building as soon as we can have them in the building. So uh, we will move forward uh, with that approach. All right, so uh, the motion on the table is for the additional request, interim request for North Mayanas in the amount of $2,597,912. Uh, Bernstein is a yes, Stowe? Yes. Hirsch? Yes. Downey? Yes. <laughs> Kelly? Yes. Kowalski? Yes. Olson? Yes. And Cher? Yes. Thank you. That passes 8-0. Uh, you know, I... I can't say it enough. We're trying to move as expeditiously as we can. And, uh, and I want to thank our, our staff for doing the same. All right. With that, the next item, <laughs> thank you to the parents of North Mayanis for being right. patient. For staying this late. All right. Um, the next item is the healthy food certification. Uh, this is a lovely statutory one. It's got two, two motions that we have to approve with the exact wording. So I will make them apologize for the length of them. I won't let me put my glasses on. I need that for this. All right. So pursuant to Connecticut general, uh, I move pursuant to Connecticut general statute section 10-215F, F, the board of education or governing authority certifies that all food items offered for sale to students in these schools under its jurisdiction and not exempted from the Connecticut nutrition standards published by the Connecticut State Department of Education will comply with the Connecticut nutrition standards during the period of July 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. This certification shall include all food offered for sale to students separately from reimbursable meals at all times and from all sources, including but not limited to school stores, vending machines, school cafeterias, culinary programs, and any fundraising activities on school premises sponsored by the school or non-school organizations and groups, period. Is there a second for this motion? Ms. Downey, thank you. So this is complete uh, Hartford overreach. Uh, Dr. Carabillo. You're muted, Anne, for the third time I caught you. I know, and I almost caught myself before I started speaking. So this is something that we do every single year. 
Last year, we added Greenwich Public, uh, Greenwich High School to this. So all of our schools uh, right now uh, are on NSLP, and we hope that you will approve this. All right, any discussion? Seeing none, we'll take a, 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 a quick roll call on the first motion. Uh, Bernstein is a yes. Stowe? Yes. Hirsch? Yes. Downey? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Kowalski? Yes. Olson? Yes. And Cher? Yes. Thank you. All right, bear with me while I read the second motion. Thank you, Connecticut. The Board of Education, I move that the Board of Education or Governing Authority will allow the sale of students so allow the sale to students of food items that do not meet the Connecticut, Connecticut nutrition standards and beverages not listed in section 10-221Q of the Connecticut general statutes provided that the following conditions are met. One, the sale is in connection with an event occurring after the end of the regular school day or on the weekend. Two, the sale is at the location of the event. Three, the food and beverage items are not sold from a vending machine or school store. An event is an occurrence that involves more than just a regularly scheduled practice, meeting, or extracurricular activity. For example, soccer games, school plays, and interscholastic de debates are events, but soccer practices, play rehearsals, and debate team meetings are not. The regular school day is the period from midnight before to 30 minutes after the end of the official school day. Location means where the event is held. No period, oddly. All right, is there a second for that motion? Miss Hirsch. All right, Dr. Carabello, unless you're going to tell me something different, is this the same? Um, yes, it is ostensibly the same. The only difference is at the Greenwich High School, we had to assure that there would be no other foodstuffs sold at any of the school events, the school, the regular school day, that if anything was sold separately, it had to be after the regular school day and not sold okay, by so the Okay, so special events held people. after the school day, so a half hour Correct. after the school day, if I read that correctly. All right, any other discussion on this item? Hearing none, uh, we will take a roll call vote on this motion. Bernstein, yes. Stowe? Yes. Hirsch? Yes. Downey? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Kowalski? Yes. Olson? Yes. And Cher? Yes. Thank you. That passes unanimously 8-0. Thank you, Dr. Carabillo. All right. Next up is the financial and staffing report. Does somebody want to make a motion to accept the financial and staffing report? Sure. Ms. Stowe, is there a second? Ms. Downey. All right, Mr. O'Keefe, take it away. Thank you. Okay. Uh, through the month of April, our uh, expense is $130.6 million, which is just about 80% attainment of the full year budget. 163.4. Uh, compared to the same period last year, spending is up 6.4%. And you probably recall from last month, we were pretty flattish. And the reason why we're all of a sudden up 6.4% year to year is because in the month of April, we had a three pay uh, month. Whereas in, uh, in the prior year, the three pay month, the second three pay month came in the month of May. So what we're going to see is that 6.4% year-to-year growth as of April decrease back down to a flattish number uh, next month. So it's artificially inflated. Um, so let's see, what else? Um, so in terms of why we're, we're up right now, it's, you know, it's Salaries, and I mentioned the three pay month. Also, uh, also due to COVID expenses not yet transferred to the grant fund. Uh, also, uh, higher outplaced tuition and settlement tuition. And then the increases are offset by savings in the following. Uh, as I've mentioned uh, since probably October, summer school and ESY savings, uh, and then transportation, we knew we had some savings from the summer. Uh, but uh, the savings in transportation have been accumulating all year long due to athletics, late bus, uh, remote and hybrid schedules, including going full remote, uh, you know, for a week following two of our vacation breaks, fuel savings, temporary services, athletics expenses, and so on. 
So we, we have a lot of savings. Um, so in terms of the full year forecast, um, we're, we, are, we are now in the process of closing out um, purchase orders. We've suspended uh, new requisitions. So it'll be on an exception basis only. And at this point in time, I, I am comfortable that uh, we have enough savings that uh, we'd be able to offset the anticipated $2.2 million exposure in special ed. So, and as far as additional savings, we're, we're working it by account, closing out purchase orders. Uh, as I said, we've uh, suspended uh, new requisitions and handled it on a one by one basis. And so I do believe we'll have additional savings COVID related, uh, but I'm not yet ready to declare what that is yet. So rather than give you a number that I'll have to bridge later on, I, I just want to say that in addition to the savings that will off, potentially offset the outplace tuition, I believe we'll have some additional savings. Uh, capital. Overall capital, uh, the, ac the actual available balance actually increased uh, by about $2 million month to month to 20.7. And the reason for that was the interim, the interim appropriation for 2.1 that we received from uh, North Mianus. So, uh, so excluding that, we're, we're basically flat to the previous month in terms of available balance. And since the start of the year, uh, the fiscal year, our capital available balance has uh, decreased by more than 17 million or about 48% of the, uh, the available balance at the start of the year. So making a lot of progress. School lunch, uh, year-to-date revenue, through April, a million five hundred ninety-eight thousand continues to lag uh, compared to the same period uh, last year when we recorded two million nine hundred three thousand. So a year-to-year -year decrease of one point three million. Uh, the big decrease driven by cash sales, which are down year-to-year -year by a million eight sixty-nine, uh, but partly offset by uh, higher reimbursements, which are up year-to-year -year by five hundred fifty-five thousand. On the expense side, uh, we're at 3,028 uh, this year versus 3,770 uh, in the same period last year. So a year-to-year -year decrease of about $740,000. And that's primarily due to lower salaries and uh, lower food costs and supply costs. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, every month that we do have unbudgeted transportation costs related to food services delivery. Uh, that will be, it's, it's on our COVID list to be uh, recovered. So that, that expense will come out of these numbers. Um, let's see, so in terms of the forecast, um, we're forecasting overall revenue will come in around uh, 2,816,000 or approximately uh, 1.342 million uh, below budget. Uh, compared to last month, this is actually a forecast improvement uh, because of our reimbursements went up a couple hundred thousand. Um, of the of the $1.3 million shortfall, uh, again, it's cash sales that are expected to be under budget by about $2.8 million, but partly offset by uh, the reimbursements, which will exceed budget by about $1.5 on the expense side, um, uh, we expect to come in at uh, 3,644,000 before transferring out the, uh, the transportation. Uh, after that transfer, we expect to come in at 3,364,000, uh, which would be an underrun to budget of about 930,000. Bottom line, uh, we're looking at uh, a, once we, once we receive the, the general fund contribution of 250 and the transfer out of 280 for transportation, we're looking like we're gonna be in a, although it's a deficit, it's, it's significantly improved from the prior months. We're, we're looking at about $298,000 deficit. So, and it's possible with reimbursements that could still improve. Um, Towards the end of the package, uh, there's a chart that I've been talking to all year on outplaced tuition. Uh, hasn't really changed that much. Uh, 
basically um, it's consistent with what we've said uh, previously that we're looking at about a $2.2 million over budget in that line. And as I said earlier, uh, I believe we have uh, enough savings to offset that. Um, let's see, uh, well, on to COVID, the, the last two charts in the package. As I've mentioned, we have four COVID related grants, ESSER one, 758,160. We need to spend that money by September 22, and essentially we already have spent it. Uh, the Coronavirus Relief Fund is a, uh, a grant of 1,203,684. We uh, have already spent that. It needed to be spent by December of 22, but as I said, we've already spent it. Uh, and then in ESSER 2, the grant amount is 4,268,046, which needs to be spent by September of 23. And uh, we, are, we are already proposing uh, to recover 2.7 million of that uh, uh, this year. So, and then the remaining 1.5 we would uh, use for, for, uh, for 21-22. As far as the ARP goes, uh, previously we mentioned that the, the uh, grant amount was 10,215,000. Uh, we recently were at a uh, conference call with the state Department of Education where we learned that the number came down about 600,000. So it's down to 9,585,423. That's the final number. And uh, we inquired as to why there was a difference. Uh, the number that 10 million two we got from Congressman uh, Rhymes and uh, apparently that was just a rough estimate at that point. Um, so the last, the last page in the package is, is basically just a, it's a, a, almost like a journal entry. So we, we to, to recover these expenses out of our operating fund, we had to request uh, an appropriation. Essentially, it's establishing a budget in a, in a grant fund at the town, mm -hmm. and that was approved by the BET. So, you know, we'll be moving 758000 to the ESSER-1 grant fund, a million two hundred three six eighty five to the coronavirus relief fund uh, over in that uh, grant fund. And then, as I said, $2.7 million of ESSER-2 spending over to the uh, ESSER-2 grant fund. The ARP fund has not yet been established, but we'll be working on that. You know, we are, before we do anything with that, we've got to submit uh, documentation to the, uh, to the state and they have to approve it. And I think uh, Tony mentioned that uh, we'll have to get uh, community uh, input on that spending as well. And that's all I have. Thank you, Sean. So I guess the, the good news takeaway here is we're going to uh, end in the black year, just uh, controlling expenses carefully to, to figure out what that number is. Absolutely. Okay, any questions on the uh, financial and staffing report? Ms. Hirsch. <clears throat> um, I had a few questions uh, in regards to the staffing report. Um, I saw that the media program coordinator position, which I believe has been vacant for a while now, um, uh, you know, uh, is still vacant. And I'm wondering if we're looking to fill that and what that timeline might be. Tony, can I ask you to take that one? Sorry, I had to find the page. Um, I'll have to follow that up for you, Ms. Hirsch. Okay, well then I, I would assume that the, my next question or two would will probably go in the same category. Um, I noted that there were several positions noted as being on hold, including the two media assistants um, for Gren uh, Greenwich High School and one for Central Middle School. And I didn't know if we'd be filling those prior to or for next year. Um, and the same goes for the food service manager positions for K-8 and for GHS as they're noted being on hold. Um, I didn't know if this was a change due to the change in food service this year um, and if we'll be filling those roles prior to next year. Um, they have set like this um, for the whole year. So we'll all have to review those again um, with HR. I believe one of the food service um, should actually be an elimination position that should have gotten, should have been moved up, um, but I will follow that up. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, the motion on the table is to accept the month monthly financial and staffing report. Uh, Bernstein's yes, Stowe? Yes. Hirsch? Yes. Downey? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Kowalski? 
Yes. Olson? Yes. And Cher? Yeah. All right. Uh, just before we get to agenda planning and uh, and take our leave of this, I just want to make note: tonight's meeting would have been at North Mianus uh, had COVID not occurred uh, and the roof not collapsed. So, just worth noting for the record. Uh, in terms of agenda planning, so Mr. Kelly, it sounds like we may need to meet on the trees, uh, and we may need an executive session to discuss whether or not we want to pursue a legal appeal. So folks, uh, it will be very soon. I will send a note out probably tomorrow looking for available times. Uh, so be ready for that. The other item that we will absolutely be scheduling uh, in short order is the results of the special education audit. Uh, that, uh, Dr. Jones, we need to figure out from, uh, from our, our friends at the, uh, at the firm uh, when they're gonna be ready to present. Uh, I will, uh, suggest we do that at a separate meeting. So once we have sense of their timing, again, I will reach out to everybody in terms of scheduling. Um, and there'll be two parts to that. One is the uh, results of the audit. And then the second part is discussion about the action plan. I think those are probably going to be two meetings. Uh, and at the second meeting, I would presume we'll probably want to take public comment. Uh, the other item, I think Ms. Hirsch, you noted SIAC is going to have a report for us. So we've got two meetings already scheduled in June. Um, one is a retreat. The other is the uh, business meeting. So if you could check with them on the timing. Um, they'd like to be added to our business meeting uh, in June. They, the report was approved uh, and finalized by SIAC last, at last night's meeting. So they are ready to submit it to us. Okay. We'll take a look at the agendas for those meetings just so that we can balance them because we do want to make sure we're, uh, we're not overloading any single meeting. All right. Anything else for agenda planning? Here. One request from Ms. Hirsch. I'm sorry, just, uh, you know, SIAC had requested that they not be put on the same docket just because they are the same subject as our audit, um, so as to not get lost in that. It, it would be a separate meeting. The audit is going to be in and of itself. That is just going to be a report out to the board. All right. Uh, what, with that, what, Mr. Kelly, I believe you have a motion. One oh, second. Sorry, it's a clarification point. Sorry, Joe. Um, you said we were going to go into an executive session to discuss the results of the audit no 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 the tree warden. no the tree the tree warden right, thing because okay that would be potentially pursuing litigation and so that is an exception to foia so we'd have to have a discussion uh any vote to pursue litigation that would be in a public session right can't vote in executive session. understood so we would need to do that soon soon because we have running. 10 days and we've already had four you got so we it, have which six is why days. i'm going to send a note to the board tomorrow with a couple of times and check everybody's availability but it, it probably will be early next week so watch your calendars and michael will remind me that we have 24 hours uh posting notice mm -hmm. so all right with that uh mr kelly get a motion you want to make well i'd like to uh, on a lighter note make a uh, uh or suggest something uh on uh monday uh, May 31st, there is the Memorial Day Parade in Old Greenwich. Uh, I would like to suggest that as the Board of Ed, we march in that parade. We get our banner uh, and show up in March. It's time to get outside and time to get life back to normal. Uh, it's, uh, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. I will second your motion and confirm that there is a banner at the Havemeyer building that we could use. All right. Uh, motion is to adjourn. Bernstein's a yes. Stowe? Yes. Hirsch? Yes. Downey? Yep. Kelly? Yes. Kowalski? Yes. Yeah. Olson? Yes. And Cher? Yes. Yeah. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>